financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... I'm Jason. Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, this podcast and everything found on the website is covered by Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot. Uh, .org. Real quick, I figured I'd go ahead and toss this out there for uh, the listeners of uh, TVP. Uh, I do have uh, Liberty Under Attack uh, direct action over political crusading shirts for sale. Uh, I've got them $15, uh, free shipping. I'll send you some other free goodies too. If you want to take a look at them, just go to libertyunderattack.com forward slash shirts. Uh, that shirt's plural, libertyunderattack.com forward slash shirts. Uh, take a look at them. We accept cryptocurrencies, PayPal, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, trying to get rid of these. Trying to get rid of these. I have, uh, I think, small, large, and extra large available. So uh, if you're interested, uh, definitely go check those out, libertyunderattack.com forward slash shirts. Uh, so welcome back, Jason. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, chat with you as always. I, I always enjoy uh, our discussions. So uh, how are things going? Uh, it could be better, Shane, but not bad. How are you doing this evening? I feel like we're, we're – I think I feel like I'm kind of going through deja vu right now, but – Things are going great, I guess, is, 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 is the, the best way to put it. Uh, so I told you last week that I got a, a, a new job, uh, you know, for uh, a sales position. And, uh, you know, I was really happy about that. Great money, great, you know, great money making potential. But I applied at uh, as an electrician apprentice about a, about a month and a half ago. And uh, this, this company occasionally will hire people that have no experience whatsoever. Uh, so I put in the application and, and just kind of waited. And uh, on last Friday... Uh, and this is being recorded on uh, on October 25th. Uh, last Friday, I got a call for an interview, and uh, I went in for a, a, an interview on Tuesday morning, and uh, turns out I got the job. So it'll be I'll be making over twenty dollars an hour uh, as an electrician's apprentice. So I and that that's what I've wanted to do the whole time, man. I mean, I I, I took shop class in high school, and I really love that uh, you know that uh, hands on that hands on sort of thing. I was going to do welding. Uh, I was going to, you know, go into a trade, but my parents kind of forced me into call it into high level indoctrination. They didn't force me, but, uh, you know, they said they would pay for it, and they said you need to go to college, Shane. So I said, okay, fine. And uh, I guess things are kind of coming full circle, and I'm really, really excited. Uh, you know, rather than pursuing a bullshit journalism degree, uh, <laughs> you know, like I, I'm, I'm really excited for this man. It, well, an electrician skill is, is it's a great thing to have. Oh, absolutely. It's not only is it a great thing to have, but it is very universal. Um, you, it is a, it is a pre and post SHTF type of occupation also. So you can, you can, you can trade it. You can teach people it. you can, you can do work for people and all that good stuff for, you know, fiat currency for silver, gold, crypto, whatever. It's, it's a very fantastic, uh, occupation and is very, very wide ranging. There's a lot of things that you could get into knowing how to do electrical work. Right. And I mean, yeah, as you said, you know, people always need electricians and, uh, you know, pe yeah, people always need, need need electrical work done. Uh, so, you know, I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, <laughs> crazy, man. I, I, I guess, you know, the, the past the past year and a half or two years have been they haven't been rough. I mean, I've been fine, but, uh, you know, my financial situation has been kind of up in the air. Uh, but I in the past couple of months, you know, things have kind of turned around. I, I made three hundred dollars in sales today in commissions. Uh, which is absolutely nuts. Uh, and, you know, I would keep doing that. Maybe I'll, I'll keep doing that on the weekends. It's a contract job. So maybe I'll do that, you know, on Saturday and do a couple appointments and make a couple extra hundred bucks. But, um, you know, free health insurance with this with this new job, too. Free health insurance. So I, I'm, I'm – <laughs> so making – you know, having type, 1 di having type 1 diabetes and how expensive that is, you know, you know that's definitely, you know, a bump in the pay – in the pay in, in the hourly pay, weight, uh, pay grade. <laughs> Oh, it sounds like a fantastic opportunity, and there's there's so much room to grow because the turnover of jobs like electrical or or mechanical or things like that that are are very hands on. The turnover is very great because a lot of people they get into it, and then they they fade very fast. But if you can get into it and and just keep doing like if you said this is what you wanted to do, you wanted to be hands on, you get into it and you keep going and and you. 
diversify your knowledge. Like if you get into knowing how to do solar panels and, and setting up all the uh, all the equipment uh, yeah. necessary for that, and then you know industrial and then housing and how to repair and just troubleshoot and things like that. It's the sky's the limit, man. It is, and I, I guess I really hadn't thought of it that way. I, I've 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 been thinking most mostly about. God, I, I, my financial situation is finally going to, you know, stabilize, which it's always, always great, right? Uh, that was kind of the, I guess, the narrow-sided approach that I had. But, uh, I mean, yeah, you're exactly right. If, you know, once I start to learn this, I mean, I could, you know, I, I could probably, you know, do the electrical for my off-grid setup uh, there at the homestead. So, and I wouldn't be able to do that now. I'd probably have to pay, pay to outsource that. But, uh, you know, with this job, I might be able to, or I'll likely be able to do that, so do that all myself. So, uh, man, it's just it's it, it, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah, not only not only be able to like to do the electrical for your cabin and whatnot, but uh, knowing electrical, knowing amps and and ohms and and resistance and and gauges of wires and all that, you can troubleshoot, right? So if your chainsaw has a short, you you can diagnose it and figure it out, right? If the tractor has a short, if a, your vehicle goes down, like you can you can. You can troubleshoot these things if you know the basics of how they work. And when you have electrical, right, it's it's a huge it's a huge benefit to to know just just even the very basics of these things so that you can fix it yourself and not have to, you know, hire out hire out somebody for a hundred bucks to you know to to fix a two minute issue. Right, right, and, and and oh, I I hadn't really thought of this until now, but you mentioned ohms, and uh, back back when when I was in uh, high school, um, I was really into subs, you know, you know, subs for my vehicle. Um, yeah, I guess I do have at least a little elect electrical experience because I did mine, and I probably did setups for for ten other friends, um, you know, with with the amplifiers. So I guess it might be a little different, but different. But I guess you know I have some experience with with ohms. I actually know like uh, I, I can actually understand that. So, whatever, whatever. Uh, so so Jason, you mentioned uh, I'm always curious as to uh, you know uh, what people are are I guess uh, digging into. But uh, you mentioned you were reading before uh, we started recording. Uh, what what you reading? Uh, I was actually reading a dystopian fantasy. Um, series called 299 days um it's a post economic collapse in the northwest it's kind of kind of status right they're like oh the constitution and this and that but it's a uh, it's a pretty good read it's it's got me it's got me thinking got my wheels turning very good very good right now i'm i'm digging into Let's see. I guess I'm digging into a few different things. Uh, I'm reading uh, Thomas D. Lorenzo, I think, is the author. Uh, the Real Lincoln. Um, I'm reading that one, and I, I just started a couple nights ago, Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. Uh, I've, I've 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 heard that. It, and for some reason, it's really crazy how this works out. But there are things that I you know never hear about, or I've I never I've I've never heard of before, say like a week ago, and then like I listen to four or five different podcasts, and that's brought up. And that's how it was a tragedy and hope, and I said, okay, I need to, I need to read this, damn it. Uh, like, it, it, like it's, it, it's crazy how that kind of happens. Uh, you know, I'd never heard of, I've, like, I've, I've never heard of some concept, some book, or something along those lines, and like in one week, I hear it like a thousand times. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> why that happens. Uh, I really don't, but I guess I take it as a sign, like, okay, I'm, I need well, to read this book, I guess. The, the universe, the universe provides, Shane. <laughs> just don't question it, just accept it. You're supposed to read that book for some reason. I guess, I guess. So, so th those are the two I'm digging into right now. Uh, I uh, need, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I I haven't cracked into it yet, but um, uh, my my podcast mate Dan brought up General Smedley Butler's book, uh, War is a Racket, on Sunday night, and then yesterday, just out of the blue, I happened to ha find a PDF link to the book. So I'm gonna crack that one open uh, once we get off the air tonight. Right on, right on. Good, yeah, good deal, good deal. Uh, Prof. CJ, you know the Dangerous History podcast. He actually has his students read that, which I think is just fucking fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a book to read. God, and he hasn't read Anatomy. He, he, I think he, I interviewed him, uh, 2016, 2015. I don't remember exactly uh, on Liberty Under Attack, and yeah, apparently he hasn't read that book and Anatomy of the State by Rothbard. I think it was that book. So like that's just really badass, you know. These kids in high level indoctrination are actually getting some symbols of truth. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, that's that's pretty incredible. But uh, you know, quite a digression. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, go ahead and get into it. So after two intermission episodes on pursuing Venus in South Chile and Antarctica, let's get back into the realm of possibilities. 
Specifically, <laughs> we're going to discuss Carrie Thornley's series, The Permanent Floating Voluntary Society, originally published in Innovator, July to December 1966, but republished in Ocean Freedom Notes, which you can get for free by, by visiting vonniepodcast.com forward slash OFN. Now, if you do want to support us and purchase it on Amazon, you can do so by visiting tinyurl.com forward slash boat freedom. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash boat freedom. That'll take you uh, through the affiliate link, and you can pick that up for two ninety nine. Although I don't expect you to. I mean, it's out there for free. Why would you pay for it? But hell, you know, if you want a Kindle version or something, I mean, you can go pick it up there. So, Jason, this is this is honestly one of my favorite things to discuss. And listeners, of the Vonnie Podcast uh, and even LUA know that for a fact. Uh, you know, pursuing venuance out on the open ocean. I really don't think there's, as far as a solution with, um, with like, if you really want to live, you know, in anarchism, like, in, I like guess, live with, without rulers, I guess, not con not uh, conceptually, but, uh, I guess, physically, there's really no better place than international waters. I mean, there really is no government. Uh, and I really do think a Vanu association of some sorts, or, you know, just a minimal sailboating family, uh, you know, I, I think all of those things are really, really possible. Uh, and I, I do think that we'll like I do think in our lifetime, I think I'd, at, whether out of necessity uh, or, you know, just, you know, someone, you know, someone's goals of, of achieving, you know, personal freedom or invulnerability to coercion. I really do think we'll see some sort of a Vanu association on the water at some time uh, in, in my lifetime. I don't think that's too far out of the realm of possibilities. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, the technical aspects of it are very, very possible, uh, you know, as as for. Building your floating city and getting to it and being in international water and being able to not only survive but to thrive. Um, it's extremely possible. Like the and, and as you said, the uh, the likelihood of it happening is is a lot greater than you know a, a quote anarchist country or us colonizing Mars or you know putting an iceberg on <laughs> on or a start, reef or starting a line family in South <laughs> Chile. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the the permanent permanent floating um, anarchist community or, or whatever you want to call it is just it's it's very very possible, and the possibility of it is is very 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 intriguing to me. And like I I'm I'm looking forward to this. We should we should just start digging into it. Right, right. I want to I want to make one one other note before before we you know I guess really get into the meat of this, but. <clears throat> but this is something that people are already doing, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, you know status or whether it's someone like uh, uh, what's her, what's her name Suzanne uh, Vanderkam. She's called the Oceanpreneur. Um, whatever like what, whatever it is, I mean there are already people pursuing minimal sailboating. Uh, there are already folks. I mean I have, I'm sure you've been out on a lake where there's Party Cove. I mean there are already flo like voluntary floating associations, even if it's just in the lake. And there are those out on the ocean too. I mean there are boating clubs that. Uh, you know, have that sort of voluntary, uh, you know, society, so to speak. So this is already happening. Like this, 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 this happens. You know, even even outright goddamn statists do this. So, I mean, like this is so practical. Uh, it, it's not even funny. But again, I will I will add the caveat that for I guess for 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 I guess people uh, you know living in the geographical location known as America, everyone knows how to drive a car. So the only, I guess, the only real simpler, way, simpler uh, solution would be van nomadism, because uh, to you know uh, pursue minimal sailboating or uh, a permanent uh, floating voluntary society, there are some there are some skills that need to be obtained that you know the the normal uh, American with a K uh, just doesn't have, right? There's a little more of a, a natural barrier to entry, I guess. The I guess uh, some more knowledge that would need to be obtained. Uh, yeah, there's a uh, there's a lot of it, it's not it, you can't just turn the wheel and and turn the boat and all this because there's a lot of a lot of a lot of techniques that you need to know right how to survive you know small waves big waves currents to read the wind to to you know go in the right direction there's it's as as opposed to a car where you're just you know your foot's on the gas and you apply the brake when you want to slow down and you turn the wheel and you follow the yellow line there's no yellow lines on the ocean. There's no, there's there's nothing like that. The 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 technical aspects of of sailing a boat are enormous compared to the simplicity of, of driving a vehicle. Right, right, and, and and I don't I don't say that to dissuade folks. I mean, yeah, I mean there are new people, you know, taking uh, I guess setting sail for sunnier waters, as Rayo would say, every single day. Uh, but it's just uh, you know. Uh, it, it, it's, I, mean, I, I wouldn't imagine it'd be hard to learn, but it'd just be a new skill that you would have to learn. 
uh, that's that's basically it. And Carrie Thornley will talk about a couple of options here uh, in this uh, in this uh, I guess in this article series. But before getting into those articles, we have to talk about Carrie Thornley, uh, Jason. We have to talk about him first. Uh, he was a very interesting character, and I will say a bit of a nut job in my opinion. Uh, but damn it, did he know his boats? Uh, so let's take a moment to dive into a little libertarian history. And what I read here will probably, I guess, uh, <laughs> bring his credibility into question, at least to some extent. But uh, I, I will say, uh, you know, just, just kind of my, I guess, my viewpoint on it. Even though th these events took place after he wrote, or I guess before he before he wrote these articles, uh, I do think he is, uh, he, he seems like a very intelligent individual when it comes to, uh, comes to the topic matter of, uh, or the subject matter of our, of our discussion today. So uh, I'll be reading a couple of pages from Brian Doherty's Radicals for Capitalism, uh, pages 328 to 329. Quote, Innovator took an increasingly cranky tone as the decade wore on. What had once been merely one of its interests became the dominant one by 1968. It arose from Marshall, Tom Marshall of Rayo, uh, his preform project. The actual plan to create the island nation faded soon enough, but their ideology, which came to be known as libertarian Zionism, remained. The idea that the only way to find freedom in this unfree world was to hide from or physically escape the eyes of the state. A libertarian is almost by definition an eccentric. These guys pushed the boundaries of mental utopianism with articles on designing a new, more rational alphabet. Some of the magazine's eccentricities can be understood by contemplating an eccentric who briefly edited Innovator. A graduate of uh, Lefebvre's Freedom School named Carrie Thornley had moved back to Southern California and hooked up with Tom Marshall, eventually editing the scene. In the late 1950s in dull suburban Southern California, Thornley had helped his high school buddy, Greg Hill, invent the comedic religion of, uh, religion of Discordianism. It was dedicated to the worship of Eris, uh, the Greek goddess of chaos. Its flavor can be gleaned from the bit of a powerful magic, the turkey curse, from its holy book, the Principia Discordia. And I'm not going to read that, it's irrelevant. Uh, skipping forward, Discordianism became the heart of the most influential libertarian novel since Atlas Shrugged, though its libertarianism is not always recognized by more economist, uh, more economistic libertarian movement types. Robert Shea and Robert Anton Wilson's Illuminatus trilogy. Thornley had a storied past before hooking up with Marshall and the Innovator. He had joined the Marines in 1959, where one of his buddies at the El Toro Marine Base outside Santa Ana, California, was Private Lee Harvey Oswald, an openly communist outfit eight-ball known as Os Oswaldskovich, to his fellow grunts. Thornley began writing a novel based on his disillusioning experience in the Marines. After hearing that Os Oswaldskovich was really meant, really meant it with all that commie talk, he actually def def uh, defected to the Soviet Union. Thornley transformed the novel, called The Idle Warriors, into a Roman eclef about Oswald, making Thornley the only person to write a book about Lee, Lee Oswald before he finally made good that fateful day in Dallas. Thornley was living in New Orleans when Kennedy was killed and hanging out in his own recollections, which some friends suspect might be largely invented, with a curious cast of characters, including some unfortunates, caught New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison's feck uh, feckless late uh, feckless late 1960s investigation into the supposed JFK murder conspiracy. It is definitely not Thornley's imagination that he was dragged into the public who killed Kennedy melodrama. Testifying before the Warren Commission and targeted himself by Garrison, who decided Thornley might have been part of the conspiracy as a second Oswald, since the two old Marine buddies allegedly looked frightfully similar, as well as because of a weird series of coincidences apparently linking them. While working with Innovator, Thornley also became an advocate of early free love cult Carista, which neo-pagan historian Margaret Adler credits as the true beginnings of the neo-pagan movement in contemporary culture. He was simultaneously hanging around with ultra-right anti-commie quasi-revolutionaries, the Minutemen. Through the 1970s and 1980s, the phony order of insanely elaborated conspiracy theories won Thornley's heart away from Eris, losing him most of his old friends. No one wants to hang with someone who takes you for a government agent, part of a Baroque conspiracy, uh, Baroque conspiracy against him. Thornley had decided that District Attorney Garrison was right after all, that he was a CIA mind control slave, that a mysterious pal in New Orleans was really E. Edward Hunt, e. Howard Hunt, and finally that he had, become, he had been a Manchurian candidate from birth with his parents undercover Nazi spies. He spent the last decade or so of his life, he died in 1998, occasionally washing dishes for a living and skulking about in storm drains, hanging out as a neighborhood eccentric in Atlanta's Little Five Points neighborhood. A pathetic fate, perhaps, but Thornley still had his, uh, his aristic fun. When the Super Bowl was held in Atlanta in 1994, he put up flyers urging, Boycott the Illegal Weapons Amnesty Program. Don't bring your illegal weapons to the Super Bowl in exchange for tickets. End quote. 
So there it is. So this is this individual, you know, Carrie Thornley, who was an editor for Innovator and a colleague of Rayo's, Tom Marshall. And, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, I guess uh, he was brought into the Warren Commission's investigation and uh, he was friends with Lee Harvey Oswald or I guess associates or I guess military buddies or whatever, whatever, I guess the, the label you know, put on it. But what an interesting guy. <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't make that up. I mean, this guy is like I don't want to say he's Looney Tunes because he's not. He's totally not. He's a very intelligent person, but. Like, just what a happenstance, man. Just like the, the coincidence of him being buddies with Lee Harvey Oswald and all this other stuff is just like, damn. <laughs> oh, man, the poor it's, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's certainly interesting. And that, that is a little, I guess, a little known piece of libertarian history. But they get, then again, a lot of folks haven't really heard of Rayo or uh, Innovator a lot more now that, uh, you know, Kyle, when, when Kyle and I, you know, made, made a lot of this stuff public. But, or I guess, brought, like, I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought it back from the dead, so to speak. But still, it's it's so so interesting. And uh, he was very much into uh, direct action, at least in the '60s. Uh, keep in mind, this was uh, originally published in 1966. Uh, in 19, uh, yeah, 1966 issues of Innovators. So obviously, the uh, JFK assassination. I think it's November 21st, 1963. I think uh, that's I it. I believe so. So yeah, this is a few years after that. So. So yeah, uh, just I guess to take that into consideration, just uh, I guess a little background on uh, the individual we're going to be, uh, uh, individual's words we're going to be reading today. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, chapter one, small boats. What's the use of being a shipmaster if you can't tell people to go to hell? An old captain's proverb. Quote, the greater portion of this planet's surface is out of the effective control of any state, and yet libertarians complain that for the man who would be free there, for the man who would be free, there is no place to go. This article is the first of a series dedicated to an exploration of the ocean interstice as a means to personal liberty and economic freedom. Small boats. Quote, for as low as the price of a late model car, an individual can purchase a seaworthy vessel large enough for a small family. This writer is acquainted with a couple who bought a used 26 feet yacht for somewhere around $500 and lived aboard with their small daughter, sailing the Pacific for a year. Since these folks were not adverse to a steady diet of fresh seafood, uh, expenses were quite low. For, as the, ma as the man of the family, he pointed out, there was no place to spend money out there. And on a previous voyage to the Virgin Islands, they had stocked up on, a, on rum at one twenty-five a gallon. For the less adventurous, a slightly larger investment will fill the galley with dry land staples. And for those who want to get grim about investing money on a boat, it is no problem to spend over $30,000 for a fancy yacht. But suitable used, or brand new, boats can be had for much less. You can save yourself time by first getting some book learning, particularly with regard to sailing terminology, a small language in itself, very important for conversing with instructors and other sailors. After you learn the diff difference between a jib and a j uh, jib and jibe, you learn the origin of such colorful, colorful, term colorful terms in everyday English as landfall, leeway, tack, bilge, and mainstay, you are ready to take a course in theoretical sailing and or small boat safety. Such courses are given gratis, uh, gratis by the U.S. Power, uh, power Squadrons, which comprise a national private organization dedicated to on-the-water safety. And for libertarians who don't mind sanctioning the state, both the U.S. Coast Guard and many public adult night schools offer similar instruction. The next step is to go out on the water under the supervision of a competent sailor. The market rate for such practical lessons at this time in Southern California is around $10 an hour, including boat rental, and worth every penny of it. Six hours of such supervised sailing ought to make you about ready to go at, go at it alone. For gradually lengthening trial, trial runs, during which you can teach yourself to navigate with the help of any good advanced sailing manual. By this time, if you have not been doing so before, you will probably be keeping an eye out for that special boat that fits you. A sailing vessel with a motor of some kind is probably the best bet for exploring the ocean interstice on a small scale, combining fuel economy with flexibility. There are boats made of steel, fiberglass, and wood. Some are built for speed and others for cruising. You'll be learning more about the choice of a boat for yourself in the process of becoming seaworthy. Meanwhile, the steps outlined above will help you get your rudder wet. Uh, end quote, Carrie Thornley. So yeah, I think the, I think the most important first point, uh, and this is something I think we pointed out in the minimal sailboating episode, uh, which I'll link in the show notes, that's uh, bonniepodcast.com forward slash intermission. Uh, I think it's 11. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, intermission 11. Um <laughs> But I mean, so yeah, you can spend as like uh, there are very you know whether it's uh, van nomadism or whether it's minimal sailboating. I mean, uh, hell, you know there are a lot of uh, you know used boats uh, out in Houston and in Florida that you could probably pick up for uh, uh, for very cheap. <laughs> and I saw I saw quite a, I saw quite a few images where 
you know, the water rose enough to where the boat, you know, became undocked and just like slid into the middle of an intersection. Uh, I'm sure you could get those like they're just kind of some some cosmetic damage, probably. Uh, and, and, you know, some some little things that might need to be done. But generally speaking, I'm sure you could pick those up at a very cheap price. So the point is you can spend as little or as much as you want on a boat, just as you could spend as little uh, or as much as you want on a van conversion. So. Uh, so regard, regardless of what your, I guess your preferences are and, and your, and your budget, uh, you know, this is very feasible. Oh, very, very much so. Uh, it's not as, as, as you said, her, uh, about the price of a late model sedan, blah, 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 blah. Absolutely. Absolutely. For, for a couple thousand dollars, you can get a boat that is livable, right? You can get a larger boat with a little bit of damage and then throw in some elbow grease and, and fix it up. Uh, fixing up the boat will also allow you to get to know the boat uh which is a, a huge deal because you don't want to your, your first time out sailing you jump it in the water you don't want to you know you don't want to jump in the cadillac of boats and then go back and and try to navigate your pinto of a boat right you want you want to learn to navigate your boat so that you can learn its its uh its its intricacies and 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 its its quirks and its little habits and and you want to learn how to drive essentially drive your boat right you don't want to learn on anybody else's boat um and yeah as as you said Houston and Florida right hurricane country those when those boats you know they get knocked up on land right the cost to move them plus the cost of to repair them uh are they like the the insurance companies will, will take those numbers and if it's worth more than the boat they'll call the boat trash and just cut the owner a check and then you can buy those boats for very cheap from salvage yards or from tow yards things like that right right and, and i will point the listeners in the direction of uh, the going mobile publication which i think i yeah i just yeah i just released that uh, you know th this past week but there's a really good uh, i guess uh, article on there uh, on on I guess acquiring you know a, a sailboat uh, and and one of the suggestions which I saw was kind of ingenious is uh, you know kind of the the boat storage yards there are people who you know they store their boats and never come back and get them which I think is really stupid but it happens and uh, you know if it's sitting in storage long enough and you know the 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 owner of the boatyard knows he's not going to get his storage fees. You know, he wants, he needs that space. What's he going to do? I mean, he might be able to, he might, he might sell it to you for cheap, or uh, he might just say, get this piece of shit out of my yard, take it. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting, uh, I guess, an interesting possibility. Uh, but yeah, I definitely refer you to uh, going mobile, com forward slash GM uh, to uh, check out, uh, you know, all of those various options uh, in, in detail. But uh, I really do like the, the outline here for, that uh, Carrie Thornley laid out. And I will say, Whenever I was in high school, uh, my uh, we had a boat for I guess very I guess maybe a year or two, and and yeah I mean the U.S. Power Squadrons I looked at what uh, probably probably when I was when I was uh, digitizing uh, uh, Ocean Freedom notes, and uh, the boating test the initial one that uh, you would get that that he recommended is one that I already took and I have the uh, the I guess the permit or license for uh, in order to be able to drive the boat. Um, it's a bullshit easy test, but but regardless, I mean, yeah, that that I think that's a really good place to start. You know, reading up, reading books on and learning the terminology. Uh, I guess maybe getting your grammar work in. You know, acquiring that that I guess that baseline information uh, as per the trivia method, and then uh, you know, kind of move forward there. You know, a theoretical sailing and small and or small boat safety, and then move on to you know actually going out with a uh, you know with an experienced sailor, I guess a trainer, uh, and then uh, going from there. So I, I kind of like the pro I like the the progression. And uh, it makes it seem less daunting, you know, kind of. So there, there are definitely some steps you can take uh, if this is something you're wanting to pursue. Oh, yeah. To, to equate this to back to driving, as we talked about earlier, uh, knowing the knowledge. I mean, that's the equivalent of reading the DMV book, right? And then you take the test and, and you get your, your, quote, learner's permit or, or whatever else. Uh, and then you go out with a with a, an instructor, right? I mean, this is your your driver's permit. You go out with an instructor. You go out with somebody that knows how to drive or, in this case, knows how to knows how to handle the boat and how to sail it and, and, and all the all the intricacies that, that, that the book doesn't teach you. And then from there you you move on and then you drive. I, I, I get I, that that's that's his I forgot where I was going with that one. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Yeah, you know I, I definitely I, I definitely uh, you know I definitely get what you're saying. Uh, and I, I guess the the last paragraph um, talks about you know kind of the type of boats I guess the there, there are recommendations by folks. I think Ray and a lot of Venuans recommended trimarans, 
because uh, they were cheap and they, you know, they they worked, I guess. But uh, you know, but there, there's really, you know, what's, well, you know, what, what are the best boats? Well, it kind of depends upon what you're doing. Are you going to be solo? Are you going to be with a family? Uh, I mean, what are your goals? Are you trying to, you know, cruise or, or are you, uh, you know, going to be smuggling illegal drugs on your boat and need something to go fast so you can, you know, make, make more <laughs> deliveries. I mean, it, it comes down to, it comes down to preference. I mean, value is subjective, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as the great Mises taught us, uh, or I guess, uh, you know, showed us. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about boats. I will be interviewing on Liberty Under Attack. Uh, let me actually get her name real quick, Jason. Uh, Suzanne Vanderveek. Uh, and she's, uh, she's, been, she's been living pretty much 95% of the time on the ocean for, for some time now. She wrote a, a new book, which uh, I'm really excited to read. But uh, I'll be interviewing her, and I'll, I'll try to get some of her recommendations on, you know, okay, what boats are out there? You know, what ones are best for, you know, say, cross-Atlantic uh, cross uh, you know, traversing? Uh, what ones would be best for, uh, you know, various situations. So I'll try to get some inf some some answers there, but uh, I don't have any specifics. So as I've said before, I mean, you know, I, I have some idea when it comes to fan nomadism because I've been driving for you know, 10 years almost. Um, but for boats, uh, I did some boating on uh, uh, on on Clinton Lake here in Central Illinois. Uh, you know, when I was 16, uh, 15 and 16. But I've never driven a boat on the ocean. I've never been out there, so. Uh, I don't have this information, <laughs> so we got to go to folks that, that do have that information, right, Jason? Oh, yeah. People with experience are very valuable tools. Oh, yeah. Yeah, needless to say. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So uh, I guess anything else you want to mention uh, on the small boat section, chapter one? Uh, no, I don't have any I don't have any notes written or anything. All right. So chapter two, large boats. Quote, I glance at the chronometer. I stare at the thin red lines. If only the shore world were regulated by forces logical as honest as the law of storms, end quote. Sterling Hayden. Large boats. A former political activist who decided to eliminate the middleman in his crusade for individual freedom, Bill Beer illustrates the flesh the permanent uh, illustrates in the flesh the permanent floating voluntary society concept. The Beer's Bill, his wife, Sue, and their three and a half year old daughter, Barry, perform the combination host crew guide service services of the new family occupation, charter sailing aboard the true love which starred as the major prop in the movie High Society, about half their days on the Caribbean. When they are not chartering or sailing on a busman's holiday, their boat is tied to the dock in Charlotte Amali of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Here the beers make repairs and mingle with the 20 or so other couples in the Virgin Island charter fleet. Uh, and I'll only quote there for a moment because, uh, Jason, you, you did some, uh, I guess, some background research on, uh, on the boat The True Love. Uh, so tell us a bit about that. Yeah, not only on the boat, but on, on Bill also. Bill is a fantastic guy, right? I mean, he is... Uh, he, he actually has a, a book out called We Swam the Grand Canyon. Uh, in 1955, fresh out of the Army, him and his buddy John Daggett swam, swam 279 miles of the Colorado River. And why did they swim it? Because they couldn't afford a boat. <laughs> That's nuts. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, uh, Dude was they, probably they, jacked or in really good physical shape. I, I would I would assume. I would absolutely assume. Uh, but it, in 1965, they arrived in the Virgin Islands on the boat True Love. Uh, the boat was built in 1926. It is a John Aldeed Malbear, the seventh schooner. Uh, and the boat is still in service, right? The, the boat still sails right now. It's owned by Schooner Excursions Incorporated in Watkins Glen, New York. It, the, you can actually see the boat at Seneca Harbor on Seneca Lake in New York. You can actually like you can rent the boat, and 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 they'll take you out on the tours. I think it's, it holds like twenty two people or something like that. And where where did you where did you say the boat was currently? Uh, Seneca Harbor, Seneca Lake, on uh, Watkins Glen, New York. Okay, New York. Okay, interesting, interesting. Anything else? No, I, that's all I got for that one. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, for that information. So yeah, a little little background on on the true love. So uh, quote: the beers acquired the capital necessary for setting up their new business by selling all of their property down to the TV set. Then they traveled to Connecticut, where they purchased the true love. At this time, Sue Beer had no sailing exper experience, and Bill had never owned a boat. They learned seamanship the hard way, under the tutorage of a dense fog, a churning inlet, a sandbar, 200 miles of inlet waterway, and a storm in the Atlantic. In that order on the trip down to the Caribbean, which prepared them for the successful navigation of the reef-strown, poorly chartered Bahamas archipelago when their motor blew up near the end of the voyage, end quote. So, 
Now, what they did to learn, you know, I, I really wouldn't recommend that. Uh, I think I think <laughs> no. what Mr. Thornley laid out was, uh, you know, a more logical and rational approach. But, uh, you know, some some individuals. Uh, you know, I guess that there might be some Venuans who, but you know, once they come across this idea, uh, you know, as someone who I'm, I'm I, who, as someone who I'm going to interview, uh, actually, had someone reach out to me, Jason, uh, who's doing van nomadism in Australia. Uh, you know, I guess a listener and a reader, and I uh, said, you want to come on for an interview? We are always looking for folks that are doing these things, and he said, yeah, for sure. So we're gonna get that, uh, you know, scheduled for sometime in November, which will be difficult considering they're in the middle of the forest, uh, you know, in a van in Australia. So the time, uh, the time, uh, the time uh, zone differences are not going to be the only obstacle, but we'll get it. We'll get it set up. But like for them, they just sold all their stuff, quit their jobs, and pursued van nomadism. So there are some of those folks that you know aren't going to get their toe wet. They're just going to dive in. And uh, I guess that just comes with you know d different personalities, different uh, different individuals, right? Uh, so I, I wouldn't recommend this specifically, but. If this is you, I mean, you know, I, I think I think that's, uh, you know, uh, it, what, what, however you get to volume, I think is a, a good way to get there. Oh, absolutely. If if you can get yourself into a situation that limits the coercion you experience due to the state, some people will ease into it, and some people will will just jump in with both feet, uh, like Bill did, and and like the like the guy in Australia did. They just. You know, poof, plunge. <laughs> Vanu. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, I, I, th I think that's that's fantastic, too. I mean, that's not the type of person that I am. Uh, it's just not. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure there's oh, some, no. some folks. No, no, that's, no, no, no. <laughs> I, like, I, like, I like to learn. I like to plan. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that would uh, kind of scare me a little bit. And uh, plus, I mean, the ocean ain't nothing to screw with. <laughs> it's not. I mean, the, the, you could I, – I don't think it would – I mean, with, with modern-day boats – uh, sure, it, it'd probably be easier to survive, but at the same time, man, you get out there in international international waters and you make a mistake. Oh yeah, I I would be I would as, as much survivalism as I know it and things like that. I would be more scared to jump in a boat and go in the ocean far more than I would to grab a backpack and a few days of food and walk off into the woods. Oh, I, I, exactly. I mean, when you when you're when you go into the wilderness, I mean, um, there's, I mean, sure, there, there might be some sort of, uh, s some sort of, you know, uh, I don't know, some sort of, some sort of fear at least, but at the same time, uh, there, there are ways that there are, you know, plenty of ways to survive out in the woods, you know, foraging and, uh, and, you know, hunting and, and things like that. But if you if, if your, if your boat goes down the middle of the ocean, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> There's not a whole lot you can do, right? There's there's just not a whole lot of options. So, uh, so yeah, I think that was that was a good thing to bring up as a comparison. Uh, you know, it may, some folks maybe may may maybe uh, you know if they got dropped in the middle of uh, the Siski region, they might be a little scared, but uh, you know they they'd have a, a lot a lot better of a chance there than if they got dropped up a helicopter or thrown out of a helicopter. Damn it! Uh, into the <laughs> middle of the uh, Pacific Ocean. Reckon I guess uh, going back to that that episode of the uh, to discussing the Alkaloop tribe in uh, South Chile, but. Um, anyway, so let's get back to it. Quote, but now Bill can say we have free, we have a freedom and an independence matched by few and the sole security of near self-sufficiency. We could ask no more. Charter sailing tourists in colorful parts of the world as the beers are doing is a good way to make money while living at sea, but it is not the only way in which a large boat can serve as a tool of production. Simple freedom from police harassment for group activities such as wild parties, clandestine uh, political meetings, illegal medical operations is a valuable condition which a boat captain can provide for a fee. In addition, he can run cargoes to out-of-the-way places on service by major shippers, provide transportation to escaping political refugees, and undertake speculative anti-state ventures, such as the smuggling of American cigarettes into Spain where high tariffs make such operations, however dangerous, extremely profitable. Smuggling opportunities in a world of anti-libertarian trade policies, in fact, are legion. One can take da diamonds out of Africa and South America, run arms to rebels in Cuba, uh, land, used, uh, uh, land used auto and refrigerator parts in Mexico, bring gold into certain near totalitarian countries where ownership of some is unlawful, all for life, liberty, uh, and property, end quote. So I want to stop there. I mean, that's something I've thought of, too, as far as, <laughs> as, far as money-making, you know, ventures. Uh, you're... <laughs> <laughs> the only risk you run is when you're up there on when when you're in, uh, out there on when you're you know going up to port 
to, to some country's port. That's really the only risk that you run. If you're out in international waters, I mean, uh, Kyle and I talked about, I think in that minimal sailboating episode, if you find an un uninhabited ocean island, uh, you know, which the, the climate may be, I don't know how many of these exist, but just go but bear with me for a moment, Jason. If you find like an uninhabited ocean island where, you know, maybe the climate would be really good for growing marijuana and you grow a shit ton of marijuana there and then you just have boats that run that to different countries or oh, you yeah. know, maybe the coast of the Pacific, maybe the California coast, something like that. Maybe California wouldn't be the best stake since you wouldn't get as much for it there. But, you know, say uh, New York or something like that. I don't know. But, I mean, there are some very good prop potential there. And uh, you being the guy, you know, maybe growing the weed on the uh, uninhabited ocean island, you would be, you know, you, know, you wouldn't be running uh, much of a risk, uh, I wouldn't think, unless I, – I, I, don't th I don't think you'd be at that, that, at that much risk. Uh, if, if you're the one – if you're, like, on the island actually growing, probably not. Because um, they'd have – number one, they'd have to find you, and then they'd have to come get you. And if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, if you're a thousand miles off land or whatever, they're not going to waste that on, on, on some cannabis. <laughs> no, no way. True. But, I mean – um, There's the inter like, inter There's the international drug smuggling thing, right? So that, like, oh, I, I guess – yeah. So, so yeah, that might come into it a little bit there, but regardless, I mean, even something just as basic as, you know, American cigarettes into Spain or whatever. I mean, be creative, guys. I mean, they're, they're, I know there are entrepreneurs listening to this episode. I'm sure you can think of a billion ideas of, of making money out in the open ocean, legal, uh, legal or otherwise. So um, just there are a lot of opportunities, man. There really are. Oh, and there's an incredible amount of opportunity because there's so much – there's 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 a lot of resources. Uh, first off, there's a lot of resources out on the ocean that you can find, uh, and second to that, there are always people willing to use the black market, right? Where for for every for almost every desire, there is a market solution. Uh, and if you have people that want cigarettes, you know, uh, off in in Spain or or in Cuba, like if you have people in Cuba that are craving you know something from you know America uh, it, it's only 50 miles from Cuba to Florida so you run up to Florida and you buy a bunch and then you drop them off in Cuba it's the the opportunities are, are very much there um if you're willing to take the risk that's that's the whole point of this is 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 freedom versus risk right it's it's coercion versus risk just as with all of the other vanu uh, all the other Vanu outlets, um, it's the amount of risk that you're willing to take on um, because the more risk you take on, the more uh, susceptible you become to coercion. Right. You know, right. so so it's, it's, it's risk versus reward. It's totally subjective. It's, it's what you're willing to do. Exactly, exactly, and that's why it's such high hopes for the Marinade Project, man. And it's it's on hiatus. I'm sure there could be some funder that you know comes in and funds it, but uh, but it is on hi hiatus now. Uh, but that's one of the reasons I you know had high, had high hopes for Marinade because once that initial you know 15 million dollars for um, the the floatel, the floating hotel that uh, barge that was repurposed into a hotel. I mean, the the it would it would have been uh, you know in between uh, Cuba, the Bahamas, and uh, Florida. So kind of right in that little triangle. So you know where. Like just kind of as you were kind of mentioning, I mean, a very good place for a free port, a very good place. So, you know, it's a very high traffic area. The case Hell Bank is. So, you know, once that initial investment was there, I mean, the, the amount of opportunities for, for profit were, were kind of we're almost endless. Uh, we're, we're almost endless. So I don't know. I think uh, I think Roger Ver and the Free Society Foundation should just buy that flow tail and, you know, just, uh, you know, kickstart Marinia rather than, uh, you know, Risk buying, risk buying land from a government or a nation state, only to have the money, only to have, uh, uh, only, only to have the uh, the drug dealer keep the money and the drugs as a kind of a, a metaphor there. So I think a metaphor, yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's that, that that's it, as we're gonna get into momentarily. That's gonna be the that's the that's always the biggest issue is funding for libertarian projects. Uh, <laughs> Liber really libertarian, li there's there's no money in libertarian movement. That's it's no. just the way it is. There's never any money, like, and that's because we live in a world that is largely corporate controlled. You know, if if you have if you have law of money, you can buy favorable laws and all that good stuff. Libertarians aren't going to buy favorable laws, right? So there's no there's no incentive there to be a rich libertarian. Right, right, and and, and you know I'm I'm kind of envious of the libertarians back in. Um... 
you know, even from like the 1950s to maybe the 1980s might get the the years off a little bit there. But for, like there were there were probably, you know, a few, maybe three to five, you know, libertarian, you know, funding outlets, uh, you know, that would wh whether it be funding, uh, you know, a publication or whether it was, you know, funding uh, a libertarian author while he wrote a book or uh, funding whatever whatever project. I mean, there used to be some funding outlets and now it's kind of, uh, you know, relegated to the Koch brothers. And, uh, you know, I don't see them, uh, you know, investing in Marini anytime soon, nor do I really want them to. That would not be, you know, good. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, the, you know, there were there were some funding ventures, uh, I guess, some 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 I guess some 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 funding uh, that was that was given to libertarians, you know, in the through, I guess in the mid in the mid 20th century. But that doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, it just doesn't. No, back then people valued freedom. Yeah, yeah, seems like seems like most people don't do that anymore. No, and I'm sure there were some ulterior motive, uh, ulterior motives with, um, with some of those uh, outlets. But regardless, regardless, um, I guess there, there's one more paragraph in this uh, in this uh, article in part two. So I'll just go ahead and read that real quick. Quote: Large boats and short offer a way to liberty for those interested in economic as well as personal freedom, but who who yet do not possess capital necessary for such permanent floating voluntary ventures as shipping lines or man-made islands to be discussed in the future articles of this series. Carrie Thornley, end quote. So, I guess anything on that last one, or should we just go ahead and move forward? Because we kind of already covered. That's I've already covered any, anything that I had to say. Uh, no, let's just keep going. Okay, chapter three: ships and shipping. Uh, quote: The term "cheap flags" refers to the three states, Panama, Liberia, and Honduras, which lend their flag indiscriminately to all ships, provided the owners pay once a registration fee and a very low yearly registration tax. Apart from this, the ship owners selling under the cheap flag are not subject to taxation. Furthermore, this freedom from taxes is guaranteed by the law of the same low level at the same low level in Liberia for 20 and in Honduras for 30 years. It is most interesting that thus, that, uh, thus three small and underdeveloped states achieved foremost positions in the world shipping market in spite of the various obstructionist efforts by other states and competitors. Uh, and quotes uh, from Peace Plans. So, I mean, what he's talking about there is flags of convenience. And that's something that's around today, um, obviously. Uh, there was, um, I'm trying to remember exactly where I heard this from. But re regardless, uh, if, if flags of convenience are important. If you if you have a boat that does not is not flying a flag of convenience or just uh, you know a flag of some country or nation state, uh, you are considered a pirate. And uh, you know this the you know the governments will do with do with uh, do with you what what they do to pirates. So. Uh, it's 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 unfor it's unfortunate. I mean, it, it is legal interstice, but thankfully this is such a, a low a low fee legal interstice that it really doesn't matter, uh, in my opinion. It's 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 I think it's highly worth it. I think this is a legal interstice that Raya would have uh, you know said hell yeah. Uh, I think this is a, a wise one. You know you, you get that flag of convenience and you can go have your 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 um, you can go have your you know floating uh, permanent floating voluntary society in international waters and not have to deal with any government. So I don't know. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I had to look it up real quick. Um, flag of convenience is a business practice whereby a merchant ship is registered in a country other than that of the ship's owner. Owners of a ship may register the ship under a flag of convenience to reduce operating costs or avoid the regulations of the owner's company. The closely related term open registry, which describes a ship register that will register foreign owned ships also exists. Uh, the term flag of convenience has been used since the 1950s, and it refers to the civil civil ensign a ship flies in order to indicate its country of registration or flag state. A ship operates under the flags of its under the laws of its flag state, and those laws are used if the ship is involved in a case under uh, admiralty law. So basically, what what it what it is, it's it's. I, I I don't for for lack of a better term it's it's a it's a, a false flag if you will right if if you're if you're Ameri <laughs> it, it it is a false flag right it, if you are an American right and and you're running things that are illegal in America but they're legal in Panama Liberia or Honduras fly that flag and then if you get caught well <laughs> it's totally legal where that you know I'm flying the flag of right it's totally legal where I'm quote from. Because I'm flying the flag of Panama, Liberia, or Honduras. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so essentially, to, to put it another way, it's uh, 
Uh, you know, it's it's a way to not be a pirate. I mean, you know, a pirate life would be badass, sure. I mean, uh, obviously, but the the idea is 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 you know becoming as invulnerable to coercion as possible. And uh, you know, pirates, you know, they they do get their fair share of coercion from nation states when they're when they're located, but uh, or governments in general. Uh, so, so, so the, the idea here is, uh, you know, for, with one of these countries where they, they just want, they just want, you know, the, you know, the $30 a year fee or something like that. Uh, they just want that kind of revenue generation. I mean, that's, that's what it is. I mean, that's, it's admitted. I mean, that's, that's why they're doing it. Um, that's, that's and, exactly and with, what, it, that's exactly what it is. You're buying a certain level of freedom. Yes. Yeah. 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 You are, you, you, you definitely are. And, and I guess another thing here is uh, with, with one of these countries where, uh, you know that the flags flags and convenience come with very you know limited laws you know put forth on that so you, you so uh, you know I, I don't know exactly I don't have any examples on the top of my off the top of my head but but yeah I mean you you want one of the you know fewest laws possible uh, and uh, you know the fewest fees uh, the fewest uh, taxes so I you know I, I think the flag I think that's a, a great way to go I, I really do you know if I if I you know set sail for sunnier waters tomorrow uh, yeah I'd get a flag flag of convenience you know I think it's uh, especially if you're I mean if, if you're gonna be self-sufficient out out in international waters and uh, hardly ever be seen by anybody or ever uh, sure you could go without one but uh, if you're gonna be doing any importing and exporting uh, you know going to ports and things uh, yeah probably probably not uh, you know, not wise to to to, to not have that flag of convenience. It's, it's almost like a driver's license, right? Uh, if you're going to be, you know, driving into uh, San Francisco, uh, you might want to have your, uh, your your plates and your driver's license and, you know, mandatory insurance if it, if it is mandatory there. So, it is. So, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a, a way to, you know, make yourself more vulnerable to coercion and utilize that interstice to further your personal freedom. Yes. Yeah, you are, you are like I said, you're buying a certain level of freedom. By flying this quote flag of convenience, and I, I love the idea. I absolutely do. Right, and and, and one and, and one other thing here is uh, obviously, as Rayo said, you know legal exercises are not to be relied upon. I mean, you know they they do get uh, you know these legal loopholes get closed and all of that, or you know say in in America like a passport would be a legal exercise. There could be a time uh, in the future where you know the United States passport is suspended, right? Uh, like there could be a time like that. So if you have a flag of convenience for the United States, uh, and you know for for some reason in the future, you know they 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 you know put they suspend that or something, uh, you're in a world of trouble. But if you get this like some small some you know smaller country that really doesn't give a shit, they just want the money. Um, I mean you're you're probably better off. I mean you're you're probably better off in my opinion. Absolutely, I, I agree completely. Okay, let's get to it. Ships and shipping. Quote, During the last century, no voice was louder in calling for government intervention than that of the American shipping industry. Not only did these shippers want subsidies in order to better compete with these subsidized lines of England, but they were quite willing to tolerate, and sometimes even encourage, trade tariffs as a means of enticing Congress to grant them privileged status. They got their intervention. Now American shipping is, an overall, is, is, in, is in, in an overall decline, and shippers are demanding increased subsidies in order to better compete with the non-subsidized cheap flag lines. If it, <laughs> if it has seriously occurred to any American ship owner that the industry's trouble is due to the expensive flag of tariffs, make work legal regulations, and yes, subsidies for other people in the resulting taxation, he is probably no longer an owner of an American registration-wise ship. For the most cheerful thing an American shipper can hope for besides a handout these days is a good and bloody full-scale war, end quote. So, just simply put, I mean, it's fascism. <laughs> fascism. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it is. <laughs> Taxation is theft. And if you can limit your theft, you're better off. Right? I mean, it, this uh, Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson, is a really, really great uh, interplay to this, right? I mean, they're talking about they're talking about needing subsidies, right, to to compete with subsidized lands of of, oh, yeah. of another yeah. of another country, and and uh, and then better to compete against subsidized cheap flag lines, right? What they're talking about is profit, right? They want they want subsidies to increase their profits. They want higher priced goods, yeah, and they want to yeah. pro probably have some sort of artificial scarcity included in there too. Oh, absolutely. They they definitely want want uh, uh, goods pr uh, <sighs> price protection and and things like that. Right, right, yeah. So no no surprise at all. I mean, this is that's what this that's is what that's what 
big corporations do all the time. Yes, and for the goddamn leftists who think that, you know, America just become fa became fascist when Dolan J. Tramp took office, you've been living under a rock. And I have no respect for you as an individual. There are a lot of reasons to despise any political ruler, but uh, yeah, whatever. I, well, whatever. whatever. <laughs> if, 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 they, if they were economically and, and morally consistent, they wouldn't be leftists. They, would, they, yeah. wouldn't, they wouldn't be rightist either, so... Exactly, exactly. Plenty, plenty of blame to go around. I just, I just find that absolutely hilarious. You know, fascism just got to America. Oh, shut up. Oh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> God. Okay, getting back to it. Getting back to oh. our quote. Uh, keeping this in mind, along with the corollary that anyone in close sympathy with the policies of American shippers cannot be expected to have much understanding of economics. The interest of libertarian will find the principles of, o of ocean transportation by James Vernon Metcalf, a professor of foreign trade at Seattle University, a very fine book. Chief among its virtues is its comprehensive yet relatively concise approach to a field that is usually written about in either a highly specialized manner or in a style so popular as to be superficial. The Principles of, o of Ocean Transportation is the introductory book for the libertarian interested in taking advantage of the freedom of the high seas on a heavy industry level. It provides orientation in all aspects of operating merchant vessels. And it goes through the, the various chapters of the book. I'll just you know read a few here. Uh, the chapter titles include Ship Characteristics, uh, Admiralty and Maritime Law, Labor Relations, o Ocean Shipping via Canals, World Fleets and Ports, Ocean Freight Rates, Cargo Documentation, etc., etc. Uh, to give you a brief idea here. Now, back to quoting. Uh, the prime consideration with regard to merchant shipping is capital. Unless you have or can raise several hundred thousand dollars, starting a shipping line is out of the question. Possibly a number of libertarian businessmen will form a company for precisely this reason. For no industry is less physically subject to state harassment, and therefore any better prospect, any better prospect for long-term investment than ocean transportation. Another possibility is for association of libertarians to form, each for the purpose of buying one ship and for these associations to cooperate under a single company trademark. Each associate could represent a particular faction within the movement. Thus, one might envision a ship with a limited constitutional government, all of its, uh, all of its own sailing beside one, without any government at all. And perhaps there would be an aircraft carrier called the Henry George, upon which the captain collected deck rents, while the sailors, uh, sailors aboard the schooner, Green Revolution, exper experimented with farming at sea. The possibilities for cooperation and diversity are at least intriguing, and the Carista people will be pleased to know that ships under at least two present-day flags have both male and female crew members, end quote. So I, I think that's certainly certainly interesting. And as we said, you know, funding is pretty much the, the, major, the major issue here. And Colin and I have joked about... Um, you know, buying a military sub, like a decommissioned military submarine or a decommissioned aircraft carrier, uh, or something like that, to get like a, a you know, a, a, a temporary autonomous zone kind of free port going, uh, which obviously that's kind of, uh, yeah, we've, we've, it's obviously a joke. I mean, uh, how many of our listeners, you know, have the capital to buy a decommissioned aircraft carrier, uh, you know, for the purpose of, you know, heavy industry? Uh, probably not many. Um, so I guess one solution by Kerry Thornley is. You know, com you know, get together with libertarians and do this. I mean, that kind of gets back to the collective movements aspect, and also too. I mean, you, I don't know, Jason. There are probably very few people um, that I would, you know, trust going into business with putting this much on the line, uh, especially in, in the libertarian community. There's some sketchy people. There really uh, are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I could like just off the top of my head, I can name like five or six maybe. And I, I'm and pretty sure we're probably thinking all the same five or six. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, but yeah, th this this idea that um, that under a single company trademark, each association could represent a different faction within the movement. C come on. Like, we still got people arguing anarcho-capitalism versus anarcho-communism. I mean, the collective movement of anarchism is just as real as the collective movement of statism. Like, I, I, I don't see anarcho-capitalists coming together and, and, and anarcho-primitivists coming together and anarcho-communists coming together and going into business together. No, to each buy a not. boat. No, I just I don't see it happening at all. No, no, I, I I certainly don't either. I think that's yeah, that's that's certainly, and a lot of these boats would have technology that anarcho primitives wouldn't want to use. So I mean, they'd be they'd be on the uh, you know the uh, the, I guess the, the image that is typically conjured of like uh, an old pirate ship, 
uh, that's what they would be selling with like cannonballs and such. And uh, <laughs> and, and next to it would be the anarcho capitalist ship with like uh, with you know I'm just you know with, with like turrets and you know high high technology <laughs> stuff. Not turrets, but, Dr- but you, you drones get... <laughs> keeping watch and <laughs> yeah, you, you, you get what I'm saying. I mean, I, I don't see that as being plausible, uh, being you know possible at all. But, but what I will say is. Uh, out there in, in international waters, you know, on, on the open ocean, there could be, uh, I mean, since, and, you know, this is something a syndicalist really should love. I mean, you know, the open ocean, no one can, like, I mean, no one can really, like, claim to the open ocean, right? I mean, you can't just, you know, uh, the 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 water underneath you is is, per, is permanently changing, you know, it's being moved, right? Um, so, you know, like, you, you can't claim ownership to the water underneath you. I mean, you just can't do that, so... Um, you know the cynicalists should like that, and obviously, you know that the, the I guess the anarcho capitalists, the free market, uh, the free market proprietary anarchists uh, should be fine with that too. I mean, there's no government; you can conduct all the business you want to. So, uh, so, 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 so <coughs> agorist, one, agorist, yep. <laughs> where are you? Yep, yep. So, uh, and that was one inter- interesting thing about the the Marinia project was something Bob Llewellyn brought up a, a number of times that you could have. Um, so Marinia, Marinia would just be that like float that floatel that floating hotel, and later down the road it would be you know kind of like a marina where like the the main, the I guess the port would be, and then everyone else would either you know they they'd have their own you know very advanced houses on the water, uh, or they would just have their boats, and you could see uh, you know Marinia there you could have you know kind of uh, an anarcho capitalist kind of uh, you know I guess. Uh, Voluntary floating permanent associate, or I guess a permanent floating voluntary community there, you know, uh, close to Marinia. You could have the cynicalist variety. Like you could have those folks, you know, in the same area, but obvious. But but going as far as to say that, you know, all right, uh, let's let's get uh, you know the the cynicalist, the primitivist, the anarcho capitalist. Let's get all these folks together. Let's uh, you know, get a single company trademark and let's start uh, you know <laughs> moving goods. <laughs> Herding cats. That's what you're talking about. Herding cats on open water. <laughs> it's it's. It, uh, I love the idea. I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of Carl Hess. I, I love the idea. I'm anarchism without hyphens. But you're not gonna you're not gonna herd cats on the open ocean. <laughs> right, right. Oh man, oh man. So it's continuing on. We got about a paragraph left here, and this is an interesting. Interesting one here. Quote, finally, should the day ever come that agoric shipping lines or whatever would decide to be done altogether with the political powers of the world, many existing merchant ships, including all those built with U.S. subsidy money, are especially made for quick conversion to fighting status. So it would not be the usual matter of armed government goons saying to unarmed businessmen, come let us reason together, end quote, Kerry Thornley. So is he saying there, I mean, let me let me reread this again, just to, so, um, are especially made for quick conversion to fighting status, so it would not be the usual matter of armed government goons saying to unarmed businessmen, come let us reason together. Is he saying that, obviously we mentioned decomm- decommissioned aircraft carriers and things, right? I-, I mentioned that just a moment ago. Is he saying that these ships could defend themselves against the state? Or am I just, am I getting this wrong here? I believe that is what he's saying. God. I don't... <sighs> so now we're hurting cats and we're going to have... An all-out war with the state. An all-out war against the state. The only way that this could be okay. So, so, so I'll, I'll bring in Erwin Strauss again. How to start your own country. Re- highly recommend that book. Uh, you can get it for free online. Just Google Erwin Strauss. How to start your own country. You can get a PDF of it. Highly recommend it. Again, when it comes to starting libertarian countries, whether the uh, Free Society Foundation route, uh, Roger Ver, uh, or whether it is, you know, something like uh, like Marinia. You know, I, I, I agree with Erwin Strauss here. I don't think it's a violation of the non-aggression principle. Uh, you know, I think the only way for it to survive is the, the by, by the acquisition of nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. I don't like it. I really don't. But if we're being, if we're being you know, practical here uh, and, you know, realistic, uh, that's the only way that a new libertarian country with limited funding and limited individuals could defend themselves against the state. And it's not a surefire way that it would work. But... I, I think that's that, that's really the only way, and I, I don't like it. I, I, I really don't. But I, I think Roger Ver is wrong in saying that's a violation of the non-aggression principle. But um, but regardless, I mean, what, what do you think? Uh, I I do not believe that having said weapons is is a violation, but I do very much believe that being willing to use them is. I mean, when when you're talking about using a, a weapon of mass destruction like like an, an a atomic bomb or, or whatever else. You're not just going to hurt the person that's 
threatening you, right? I mean, only individuals act, correct? Right? So if if when we drop the bomb, or when we, quote unquote, when the U.S. government dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, they weren't targeting the people threatening them, right? They weren't targeting the military. They were targeting civilian population. They killed, like, tens of thousands of civilians, of, of non-combatants, right. of people that had never even, you know, looked in the direction of the United States, have never even, you know, uttered the words and just pff, off the map. I mean, I don't, I'm not a fan, not at all. Right. No, I, I, I'm right there with you. And and I li I really do love the way that Erwin Strauss discusses this. It's matter of fact. He doesn't lay out his opinion. He just says, here's, I mean, here's, here's, here's what I believe, or I, I guess it, I guess it is his opinion, but he hasn't placed, I guess, his moral judgments on it. He just says, you know, this is – in order for this to be successful, and he was the authority on the subject. I don't mean authority like the state. Like he was the he was the guy that was involved with a lot of these new libertarian country projects. But he said, uh, he said, quote, now new some country or, uh, some new country organizers will uh, will uh, adjust my screen. Now, uh, now some new country organizers will recoil at the thought of inflicting large numbers of casualties. But the fact is that war and the inflicting of such number of casualties lies at this heart of statecraft, and he who has no stomach for it needs to look for another line of work. The only way that a nation or country can avoid having to inflict such a casualty, such casualties, is to convince all that it is ready and willing to inflict them. End quote. So, as, as you're well aware, Jason, the the, the, the solutions I'm 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 seeking out or you know make, like van nomad as much possibility homesteading uh you know looking more like it'll it'll come into fruition sooner than i thought um you know i, I go for these kind of individual strategies i don't want to rely on other people but the point is and i think erwin strauss is, is is correct here uh if you're going to be starting a new country and roger ver just because it's not a country uh that's what everyone else will see it as it's a statist um this is a part of statecraft right how how do how do states uh, and countries retain their territory. How do they do that, Jason? They do it through um, violence. Through violence. So if, and you're going to enter, and, if you're going to enter, if you're going to enter this, if you're going to enter this line of, if you're going to enter this line of work and you want to be successful, you've. You, I mean, it, it's like um, entering into a football game and thinking you don't have to play by the rules that the NFL lays out. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, now maybe there's maybe there's some ways around that. I don't know, but but still, the the, the point is that. If any new libertarian country wants to survive, then I, I I don't see how it's feasible without with without that sort of without that sort of a threat. And obviously the goal would be never having to use them. Um, but if the country wants to survive, that, I mean that that that, that as he said that that it is ready and willing to inflict them, as as Erwin Strauss said. Uh, now Jason, I I I hate that. I, I do I do. I'm just laying I got I'm just kind of laying out what Erwin Strauss said. You know, if this is going to be successful, then. Uh, all right, folks. We're, I mean, what, what are you going to do about this this massive problem known as the state, right? Because uh, I've looked into the, the various case studies uh, uh, in the past, and um, you know, the lack of defense is a major issue. It really is, right? So, not saying I like this. I'm just laying it out, kind of matter of fact, like Erwin Strauss did. Uh, absolutely. Uh, self defense, right? Self defense is, is a human right. We all understand that. But what we're talking about here is not individual human right to self-defense. What we're talking right. about is the collectivist country's right to self-defense, right? And and as libertarians are so proud to to peacock again and again and again, only only individuals act. Well, when you have a libertarian country that is not only willing but is able to defend itself with with a nuclear weapon blah 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 the state the 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 country that you're taking the land from i mean if we're talking like out on the open ocean that's an entirely different story but we're talking you know like liberal land like we talked about before liberal lands in the middle of two countries right both of those countries have the ability to just walk in and, and wipe that country out if the country of liberal land doesn't have the ability to defend itself uh, from these two Goliaths, then it's not going to last because eventually one of those two countries is going to get pissed off and just wipe them off the map. 
event eventually yeah yeah I, I i completely agree with you and i i can't remember where i read this so just take this for you know you and also the listeners take this for a grain of salt but what i i guess what i heard about Liberland, why i don't remember the two countries either but why these two countries aren't doing much about it is that they both of the countries really don't care about that land um, but it's as, a, it's but a that, swamp. Yeah, yeah, and, and as Erwin Strauss said, the, 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 the goal of nation states and countries is to, is to keep the number of countries down so they can control the game. Um, they, they don't care about that land, but what they care about is that there's a, you know, a new, like a supposed new country, they aren't going to recognize it, called Lieberland. Um, they aren't going to recognize it, but at the same time, you know, they're, they're, they're quarreling over, over who actually owns that. Uh, and there's another another territory that they that they both lay claim to that's that's more important to them. So um, I, I I read that somewhere and I I, I don't recall where I where I did. I w I really wish I did. But um, there's a there's a very good reason why neither of those countries have just gone in and taken it over. And I think it's a dispute over some other territory. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'll just I'll just kind of uh, uh, you know leave it at that. Uh, you know the, these new country projects I. They, you know, we mentioned before, you know, the lack of funding in the libertarian community, libertarian anarchists, and even the and community community too. But Venuans don't really care about, you know, that lack of funding in these in, in these uh, projects because it doesn't cost much to be a Venuan. But regardless, the lack of funding is a major problem. Um, the a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, you know, may may like some idea like that, but it, it's it's it's. It's tough to uproot your entire life, and especially if, if you have a family and kids, uh, things like that. Uh, that's a major, major change, and a lot of folks, you know, are unable to uproot their entire lives to go live on some new libertarian country, whether it's on the water or not. Um, that would be number number two, and also number three is just the state. We've been kind of talking about that for the past, uh, you know, ten or fifteen minutes or so, and that's a major, major issue. And that's I, I really do think that that's that's going to be the major, the major uh, reason why. Uh, none of these things will, will really ever come into fruition. Now, I, I, I hope I'm wrong on that, but at the same time, we've been talking about what nation states do and how they retain their power. And yeah, unless uh, unless a uh, libertarian new country is willing to, to do the same thing, then uh, they're not going to exist. They're just not going to. Uh, unless it's, uh, I guess, the, the only possible other solution would be, like, say, Roger Ver and the Free Society Foundation, uh, you know, do make some agreement with the government. And uh, um, yeah, they, they do make some agreement with the government. Um, why would that nation state or government just outright sell that land? I'm guessing what will happen is there will be like a 99 year lease and um, they'll be given kind of like, a, I guess, an exclusive economic zone, kind of like uh, like Hong Kong uh, used to have. And uh, they'll build up all that infrastructure and, uh, you know, it'll be a very, very profitable place. And then I just imagine the, uh, the, the, the abutting country, the selling country will just take it over, right? Uh, because uh, you know libertarians and anarchists they hate war and I, I hate war too, so could they really? I mean, you know, government's not stupid. I'm sure you know that a lot of them have you know understand libertarianism to some extent, uh, <laughs> and, and may, may, uh, maybe not. But I don't think they would take any even even if uh, you know one of these libertarian countries had uh, you know weapons of mass destruction or, or, or a nuke. I don't think they would take you know that threat very seriously, right? Because the last thing any you know person any proper Terran anarchist, uh, individualist anarchist would want to do, or would even, they would never advocate for that, right? Um, you know, the, the, the detonation of a nuclear weapon. So I, I, I think even that might uh, <laughs> might be a problem. So yeah, I, I just don't see, it, I don't see this this really coming into fruition. We've kind of taken a little, digre we haven't digressed, but we've, we've gone beyond um, what, what Kerry Thornley said, but I'll turn it over to you. Do you have any, any anything else there? I, I just want to say that real quick, right? Any libertarian country that is willing to detonate a, a nuclear weapon or uh, uh, an atomic weapon of, of any kind is not a libertarian country because they're not right. living up to libertarian values. Yep, ends means ends means consistency, and you know, function determines form. So, yeah, yeah, and, th and this is you know that's why I, I, I like that's why I love Vanu so much is it doesn't rely upon any of those things. You can live consistently and principled, and you know, still in, increase your freedom or your invulnerability to coercion. So uh, there's one footnote here um, that I want to read in this, uh, in, in this, uh, you know, concluding this uh, this article. Uh, Kerry says, quote, Now and again, one hears of a of war surplus, surplus liberty ships or something of that order for sale uh, at less than $100,000. By the time such vessels are put in a sailing order, I have it on good authority. A fantastic monetary outlay would be needed. 
I have not priced ships extensively, but do know of one medium-sized tanker in bad condition that was valued at $400,000. Of new ships, those made in Japan are said to be among the most reasonable, and those built in the United States are exorbitant at no appreciable increase in quantity uh, in quality. Uh, in, uh, in quote. So, $400,000 in 1966. <laughs> so we're talking, you know, upwards of a million dollars, probably. So, I mean, the Free Society Foundation could buy one, and, and if they were, if they were really, if they were really serious, Jason, they should be pursuing, or, or I, I don't want to, you know, put out. Okay, this is my preference. Obviously, I'm not saying they should do anything. Like they, they not like not, no ought or should or anything like that. But if they were really serious, I think they would pursue, uh, you know, freedom on the open ocean instead. Um, they would have, uh, you know, taken heed of Erwin Strauss's words back in uh, 19. 67 or 1970 or whenever that book is published um but yeah i i, I guess that's <laughs> we're talking about a lot of money here a lot of money here uh a heck of a lot of money I'm, I'm actually trying to look it up right now on the dollar times inflation calculator let's see go for it yeah okay four hundred thousand dollars in 1966 has the same buying value as three million thirty six thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars in two thousand seventeen. Wow! So inflation. <laughs> I'm not surprised that inflation has you know been that bad, but you know I was thinking you know twice and, as much is is reasonable. Shit. Annual inflation over this period was about four point zero five percent. All right. Wow. <laughs> so, right. yeah. All right, let's 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 get forward here. We'll we'll get more into uh, uh we'll, I think we'll return to that discussion here after after this one. But uh, chapter four, Marine Cities. Quote: In Japan, a restaurant has been planned under the ocean where patrons can watch the fish and vice versa. And perhaps it won't be long before some enterprising American builds a resort hotel nestled 12 fathoms deep on the pure white sand of a reef valley and hemmed in on all sides by tumbling gardens of coral and the constantly changing, multicolored life of the sea. End quote: The bountiful sea. Those that there's actually um, I saw I watched a video of one of these. There's actually there actually is uh, maybe there's room or rooms plural um, that you can actually rent that are underneath the ocean. Uh, I don't remember where maybe Fiji or somewhere like that. But I watched a video of it and it's it's badass. You 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 lay there on the bed and you can just see fish swimming around you. Like it's awesome. But yeah, that didn't happen. That wasn't there in 1966. But yeah, that does exist now. Yeah, that would be absolutely just fantastic to. It costs like 5,500 pounds a night, though. So I don't know what that would trans. Like we're t we'll talk we're talking at least five grand a night. So it's pretty expensive. I mean that's yeah that's that's a lot of money. Well yeah the the overhead would be tremendous. Right. I, I don't even know how you would go about doing that, but I'm not an engineer, so I guess that makes sense, right? Uh, oh, all right. Hey, there's there's one in Florida. According to this, uh, let's see, Zanzibar. Let's see where are some of the other ones. Uh, Maldives. Sweden has one. I don't know. Key Largo, Florida. Depth of 30 feet. That's uh, $800 a night. Hell, that's reasonable. Uh, one in the Fiji at 40 feet, and it's only $30,000 a week for the couple. I think that's the one <laughs> I was talking about. Uh, and there's one in Dubai. Which, uh... 65 feet deep, and they do not list a price, so you can bet it's expensive. Right, right. So yeah, those 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 things uh, those things definitely do exist. But let's see what uh, Mr. Uh, Kerry Thornley, uh, ex associate of <laughs> Lee Harvey, also will have to say about this quote. <laughs> I had to bring that up again. Quote, many previous issues of Innovator have contained reports on the pirate industries of the North Sea, commercial endeavors which do not pay protection money to the governments of Europe since they are located outside the ter territorial boundaries of some as defined by international law. As the food, mineral, and living space, space potential of the sea come more under the control of technology, enterprises of this nature increase in number on continental shelf areas all over the world. End quote. So something I, I don't have anything specific there to, to talk about, but the question I have... Hmm, let's see here. So the question I have is, right? Let me let me back up and provide some context here. If you know underground hotel or I guess underwater hotels become like a, a thing, you know, like they become, you know, you know, as the technology becomes cheaper and it becomes more more widely available, I wonder if 
you know, those would still fall uh, fall under the same regulations and taxation as, you know, um, an, an above ground hotel on, you know, like an island. Um, now, to answer my question, is to a certain extent, I guess it would depend upon whether they were in the uh, contiguous zone, which they probably would be, uh, I would imagine, up to that, uh, what is it, uh, 20, 27 miles off of the coast. I mean, it's been a while since I've looked into that. 27 miles off of the coast of, a, of, a, of an uh, existing government. If it's within the contiguous zone, there are some regulatory powers, but I don't think they... It is kind of open-ended, though, so maybe they would fall under the, the same taxation powers. But if, if for some reason, you know, if, if, if there is a legal interstice there, Jason, where these underground hotels or these underwater these underwater hotels would lie outside of that realm, uh, you know, those might become a lot more feasible in the near future, you know, price-wise. Oh, not only price-wise, but as technology advances and as structural engineering advances and as the ability to live off the grid advances, right? That the technological ability to live off the grid advances, the plausibility of an underwater hotel or an underwater home uh, greatly increases in my opinion. You know, once, once yeah. you have, once you have the, the structural engineering down of it um, and the, the structural engineering in order to create a, um, a, a dome, a, 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 a dome, you know, for lack of a better example, like Sandy Cheeks on SpongeBob, she lives in an air dome, right? Once you have the ability to do that, then theoretically the possibilities of even like farming under the water, you know, in, in this, living this air dome, living under the water, farming under the water, you know, you can do with grow lights and things like that. Like you don't actually have to have sunlight. You can use ultraviolet lights and, and grow lights and things like that. And you could, you could theoretically be completely self-sustainable in your underwater. Utilize, utilizing ocean thermal energy conversion or the waves for your power. Holy hell. But Jason, yep. you really, you, you really use the SpongeBob example in the Vani podcast. I don't know how yeah, I feel I, about that. I, I have kids. I've watched a lot of Spongebob. <laughs> I'm just giving you shit. <laughs> but uh, all right. All right. Let's see here. Let's, uh, I'll, 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 hand, I'll hand in my anarchist membership card. <laughs> <laughs> Your Vanuan membership card. My Vanuan membership card? Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's get back to it. Quote, farming the sea for both fish and edible seaweed is emerging from the experimental stage. Some 20% of Japan's coal is mined from beneath the ocean floor, and countless other pilot mining projects, for every mineral, mineral imaginable, are underway around the globe. The bottom of the sea is also already a widely recognized storage place. One U.S. city stores its water supply beneath its harbor, and fuel has been stored successfully by the U.S. Navy in the Gulf of Mexico. The prospect of sea cities on and under the surface is now taken for granted by informed prognosticators, and the prospect is immediate. There are two ways libertarians can take advantage of these developments. One, focus educational oh God. Uh, focus educational efforts on the men and women who are involved in these projects. Meet and become acquainted with ocean frontiersmen. Think how handy such friends might be in an economic or political crisis. Ask them many questions. Find out what their professional problems are and suggest solutions that are in accord with their libertarian principles. Inform them of their rights above the law. Tell them how to foil the status mentality and defeat the ex uh, expansionist efforts of the national bureaucracies. These are things you can do no matter where you live. The marine biology professor at a Midwest college is as much part of what is virtually a second industrial re revolution as the hypothetical enterprising American who builds a resort 12 fathoms down. And if you live in an Arizona ghost town, you can still write letters or even newspaper columns. Demonstrate to the marine pioneer that his, that his prime advantage is the long tradition of freedom of the high seas and that it will be, will be personally profitable to him if he does all that is within his power to maintain it, end quote. No, I did kind of, I guess, oh, educational efforts. I, I don't like educational efforts all that much. Um, but I guess some people could argue that Vani, the Vani podcast is an educational effort, but at the same time, it's not, it's not educating people on, you know, free market economics. I'm not saying any of those things are bad, but action, guys. You know, educa education has been happening you know, since the, since Fee was founded back in, like, the 1940s by uh, Leonard Reed. Yeah, Leonard Reed. So, or not Leonard Reed, um, the author of I Pencil, whatever the hell his name was. Is it Leonard? No. He has a son. I get confused between get, get confused between them. But regardless, educational efforts have been going on for a long time. It's time for action. Um, but as far as uh, you know, what he had to say there. I mean, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, I I agree exactly with what you said. I mean, education is fine, but <laughs> it doesn't 
it doesn't get you anywhere. You know, it's, it's just spinning wheels. Right, right. No, I, 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 I do agree. You know, if there are any, like the, uh, uh, there was apparently going to be a consultant, like a structural engineer or something along those lines, um, or an oceanic engineer, if that is a thing. I, I think that might might have been kind of the the, the label. There was a guy at the the Marinia project, some sort of scientist. Uh, you know, I don't see anything bad about you know you know becoming acquainted with those folks and you know teaching each other. Uh, I certainly don't see anything bad about that. But you know, kind of you know focusing on the educational efforts on this. I mean, this is I, I don't know. I, I I think there's some interesting ideas, but I don't know. I I don't <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> anything else there. No, nothing else. Kind of a dull point. I'm kind of disappointed. But uh, anyways, quote, concentrate investment of resources on maritime metropolis projects, particularly on man-made floating islands and other highly mobile capital, since this can be defended against future attempts at control or confiscation by the world powers. And quote, I'm going to stop there. Yes, I, I like, yes, temporary autonomous zones. This is one thing. If there is, like, if, if a free port, you know, uh, if, a, if a libertarian anarchist Venuean free port were to exist, um, and, and exist successfully outside of, you know, the realm of, uh, you know, regula regulatory or nation state powers, I do think it would have to be a, a temporary autonomous zone, such as, again, for any of you guys that have the money for a decommissioned aircraft carrier, um, <laughs> you know, get, get one of those and just have like, uh, you know, have it be a, a, a mobile, you know, a mobile, you know, free port. So, uh, um, you, you put out a tweet and you say, uh, all right, the, um, the, um, the Agora carrier or the Agora market will be, uh, in international waters located, uh, you know, this latitude and longitude or this nautical mile distance from whatever destination, uh, come out and buy and sell weed and drugs and all that sort of stuff or whatever the hell would be, you know, bond sold or just, you know, legal things outside of, you know, uh, untaxed and unregulated. That would be very feasible because you could just pick up and leave, right? You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be, uh, I guess, uh, relegated to a certain geographical location. So I think that's a very, very fantastic idea, and I salute Kerry Thornley in the non-status way for that suggestion. Well, absolutely. And, uh, just to continue on that point, um, I looked into this a little bit, right? The, the ability to create a man-made floating island, uh, and those pl those blue plastic 55-gallon barrels. Uh, put a plug on it, and each one of those barrels will hold 459 pounds while floating. All right, so if you were to get 10 of those and a couple sheets of plywood, that sheet of plywood, you know, you're going to be able to hold 4,500 pounds. So if you got your you got your boat out there, throw <laughs> throw some barrels down, throw a sheet of plywood onto it, secure it. Bam! Instant floating island. You got your own little anarchy island there to do whatever business you need to do. And then uh, pack it up and bring it home or, you know, ship it or tow it somewhere else or, or do whatever you need. It's it's entirely possible to do a man-made floating island. Pontoon boats. Yes. Pontoon boats do it all the time. Right, right. Yeah, and that's I, I'm, I'm glad you found out the, the specific, uh, you know, measurements of that. Uh, but and, and you can get those things for a lot of times for free, man. I know we the, uh, the, the dock we have down there at our property in Southern Illinois is held up by those things. So uh, and I think we got a lot of those for free. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, you, you could you could do it, uh, you know, yeah, pr pretty cheaply, I would say. Uh, maybe we just got lucky. I, I don't know how often those are given away for free. But but regardless, I mean, yeah, that's that's, that's certainly a, a, you know, a possibility. And I will mention. Um, so yeah, like uh, four years ago, we went to uh, Isla Mujeres, which is uh, off of uh, off of Cancun. It's an island, island of women. Uh, it's not as crazy as you think it would be. Um, oh, damn. <laughs> no, it was a lot of old people, but it was still it was still a great experience. Everyone drove around on golf carts, and uh, you know uh, you would it, the, the the bludgies there. Uh, so yeah, everyone drove around on golf carts, and everyone drank on the golf carts. So, like the bludgies would just sit there and like wave at you. Like that was like okay, like funded by taxation, but cheers, mate. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyways, there was uh, there there was one guy uh, who, and this is kind of a, a tourist attraction. He, he he's interviewed. You can find interviews with him on YouTube. But um, he actually built a uh, a man like a, a man made island out of plastic, you know, out of uh, you know trash plastic bottles, uh, and the I guess. 
the I guess the vegetation, you know, in the in the lake, uh, you know, grew up around it, and it's actually a very stable platform. Um, so an artificial island, and it was uh, it was off grid too. I mean, he had a he had a solar panel out there, uh, and uh, you could you could actually go on there, and you could actually go get a tour of his place. Um, fortunately, he wasn't there whenever we uh, you know to, when we uh, you know meandered on down there, but. Uh, at the same time, it was it was cool as shit to look at. And in, the, in one of the interviews I saw, he wanted to move it out more so. Um, he wanted to, you know, tow it out into kind of the ocean. And I was like, that'd be pretty neat. I don't know if he actually ever did it, but um, very interesting, interesting little story. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of ways to to do to construct these man-made islands, uh, these these artificial islands. So uh, <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's plausible, man. I I, I really do. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's entirely possible. I mean, as you said, he had a solar panel, right? I mean, that's if you if you if you have flotation and a solar panel. Beyond that, there's so many things you can do if you have the power, right? The, through the solar panels. I mean, you can set up, uh, you can set up like an electric motor. I mean, to to move your little island. I mean, you can set up, you know, electric uh, desalinization plants and or. Um, uh, uh, you can set up like a like a hydroponic system with automatic watering, uh, whatever. There's there's a lot of things that you can do with just super basic uh, available technology. Right, right. No, I, I I certainly agree. I certainly agree. So so the the main point I wanted to make there was temporary autonomous zones. You know, Rayo Rayo saw a lot of value in mobility, which is why he had uh, why he first pursued van nomadism. If the, if the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. And why he chose uh, Wilderness Vanu and had various different squat spots, or not squat spots, but he had very various different Vanu home bases. Uh, so mobility is uh, definitely important. I think uh, you know carries right on point here. He wasn't he was an editor of Innovator and a friend of uh, Rayo's, so I guess that doesn't really surprise us at all. But uh, anyways, quote. Another possibility that should not be entirely ignored, though, is the bubble on the bottom concept, especially as a means of hiding large quantities of property. Construction costs are often less, and protection from storms is usually superior. Nor are monetary resources all that can be invested. A student entering the university can direct his studies toward aspects of the oceanic scene, in most cases with little or no shift in his field of interest. The student of law, for example, can specialize in maritime and international law. The engineer can focus on marine engineering, etc. Servicing and communications industries will also have a market in marine communities. A private sea air postal system and a few, few libertarian edited marine industrial journals might get things off to a good start. Future articles in this series will, will report on specific commercial activities, which are now thriving in salt water, many of which are probably on the sites of the free cities of tomorrow's voluntary world. And quote Carrie Thornley. So, so yeah, I guess uh, the main points here, you know, <laughs> store, storing stuff on the storing stuff in the ocean. Okay. Sa Sandy's bubble. Sandy's dome. <laughs> SpongeBob. Two SpongeBob references in one episode. <sighs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I as as far as those other things, if someone's going to be in uh, high level indoctrination, uh, you know, focus your studies on more, I guess, the the ocean variety. And uh, if uh, you're going to be going to law, uh, I okay, I don't I don't recommend this one. Uh, yeah, I, no. I, I don't. Uh, lawyers, the lawyers are the ones that wrote the laws for the police state. They were the ones that created the fourth branch of government, the administrative agencies, the national security agency, and all of those other terrible, no. uh, those uh, terrible agencies. Uh, uh, you know that do ever that uh, are the uh, judge, jury, and executioner uh, on their uh, on their own right, so to speak. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, Vanuin, no, <laughs> there's no, there's no, I, I'll go ahead and just and just say that in my opinion, there's no such thing as a Vanuin lawyer if he uh, still has no. his, if if he still has his bar card and he still practices. Oh, absolutely not. If if you are a Vanuin, then you do not believe in an appeal to authority. That's exactly what the law is. If, if you specialize in, in maritime and international law, if you're a law, uh, if if you're dealing with the law at all, if you're trying to, you know, court cases and all that, it's an appeal to authority, right? You are asking the government. You're trying to fight the government through legal means to to win your freedom, and that is that is an appeal to authority. You are asking the government to allow you to be free. You're subservient. You're, you're subservient to them. Uh, if, you, if you do something they don't want you to, they can always strip away your bar card. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, I don't like that uh, that that little suggestion. Um, now, if there is ever a circumstance where a lawyer was needed, I'd say outsource that. 
uh, you know, just con can contract that out uh, if it's ever necessary, which I don't know. I, I can't think of any instances where it would be. But regardless, I, I, I don't recommend any Vanuans. If there are any 18 year old Vanuans listening, don't take uh, please don't take that suggestion seriously and just. OK, well, I'm just going to go in inter international and admiralty law then. That's what I'm going to do for my for my uh, high level indoctrination pursuit. Oh, please. I guess. Do what you want to, but it's not something we'd recommend. Uh, if you're pursuing Vanuans and you've listened to all the episodes, it should be very, very clear why uh, that would be a, uh, a a bad strategy. A bad strategy. But anything else? Uh, yeah, one more point I wanted to make. Uh, the idea of, of specializing towards an education. As we talked about earlier with the different ships under the same you know, copyright code or, or, or limited liability, whatever, LLC, um, the idea of specializing can be both good and bad, right? If you specialize uh, in in engineering, right? Well, if you specialize in engineering, right? Well, maybe you you're gonna lack somewhere else. You know, if you specialize in uh, you know growing food on the ocean, well, you're gonna lack in something else. So I don't. Unless unless you have a party and each person specializes in one thing, gears it toward the party itself, you know, to, to make the, the, the party itself better, uh, then I can make an argument for it. But I do not believe in specializing. I believe in being a jack of all resources, right? Yep. Knowledge, knowledge weighs nothing, right? That is – that's – Something that they that they teach you in survivalism a lot is knowledge weighs nothing. If you know how to do a large variety of things well, you're a lot better off than if you know how to do one thing very very well. Right, right, and and, and say say this is a a Vanu association here, and you have you know maybe say ten people, and uh, you each have your specialties. And that's kind of what you focus on. That's how you trade, barter, all of those, all of those good things. Well, what if uh, your, what if your uh, boat repairsman dies? What yes. are you gonna do? Um, so, so I think I think a better way, a better way to do this. And I think Derek Bros in the uh, the Houston Free thing, or I guess uh, maybe in their Freedom Cell Cell group, they do this. But, but the idea. So, so yeah. I mean, I I have my specialties, Jason. You have your specialties. Um, you know, if, if we are in a freedom cell or Vanu association, I think the, the best the best route to go would be uh, we teach each other our specialties and we all are able to do everything so that, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, if John if John dies and he's uh, he's uh, our I don't know, our our, uh, our 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 farmer. Right. He's the one that's, uh, you know, understands all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> so so if he dies, unfortunately, we can still, you know, keep doing what we're doing. We we, we can, uh, you know, d division of labor and all. We we know what he's doing, and we can we can kind of take over there. So, uh, I'm right there with you. You know, having a specialty is good, but at the same time, uh, I don't think it. I, I think you know, being able to do a lot of things is is, is certainly preferred. Oh, absolutely. Uh, being able to cross train people and <sighs> knowing a large variety of things, it's 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 it not only not only not only knowing how to do different things, but like if, if you specialize in one thing, then you're going to get stuck in that one thing, you know? And if your voluntary association group falls apart or, or whatever else, well, now you are stuck again, knowing only this one thing. And that's the only the niche that you can, that you can assert yourself in, uh, in another group. But if you're cross trained, then you have a large variety of skills and you can, insert yourself into another group wherever they need the help right right i guess one final point uh you know ha having those having those so say say i'm an electrician and you're an engineer you know if we kind of stay off to our own sides uh you know we, we could probably be efficient on ourselves but when you combine in like electrical engineering you know th that could also you know further the technology and the bonding association too so if um i think daryl becker used this this reference you know when, when people specialize in things um they're at the top of this mountain peak and i'm probably gonna you know put this badly but they're at the at the top of their mountain peak and they really don't know what anyone, anyone else is doing so being it like you know furthering furthering you know the the technological capabilities of a Vanu association uh would certainly I think, you know, uh, cross-specializing might be a, a better way to put it. Uh, cross-specializing in various things and, and combining, you know, all of these things to, to, to I guess, uh, provide a, a better a better volume association. All right, so Chapter 5, Aquaculture. 
uh, quote, control of foodstuffs in the, uh, in the sea has a beginning similar to that of its counterpart of land. Start with the weeds. When the weeds become cultured, we, we call them plants. Once culture takes hold, then yield accelerates, and we have more than enough for our immediate needs, end quote, uh, Robert M. Snyder. Aquaculture, quote, Japan is the world's leading nation when it comes to farming the sea. Over 20 kinds of sea plant, for example, are marketed there for eating purposes. Some of these are harvested wild, but many are cultivated from seed, transplanted to oceanic nets, and harvested about two months later. They are then dried on sheets on bamboo mats. Uh, this end product, well, it usually requires the Occidental that he develop a taste for it, is rich in vitamins and very popular with the natives of Japan. In 1954, Dr. Matusaku opened the first commercial shrimp farms in Japan. Nine years later, he was shipping 70 pounds of shrimp per day. He has bred shrimp up to eight inches in length, and he is also breeding prawns, a total of 2,860 pounds in 1961, 500 tons in 1962, and more than 1,000 tons in 1963. Another popular oriental food is a shellfish called the wreath shell. These have been artificially inseminated in a single batch of 200,000 eggs produced per insemination. The Japanese also sus suspend racks from floats and grow oysters upon them in quantities of about 20,000 tons per year. And about 2,200 tons of eels are harvested each year on over 750 eel farms. In addition, bream, blowfish, bass, halibut, and gray mullet are also bred by fish ranchers. And when the market is bad, there are fatteners who will buy a part of a fish crop to retain in holding tanks for speculative purposes. The market is open for the ambitious entrepreneur who is ready to stake out his claim and start farming somewhere beyond the three-mile-long arms of the land-going pirates of our time, and quote Kerry Thornley. So, I mean, I, he's right. I mean, as far as, uh, you know, food production in the open ocean, man, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we do this here in the United States a lot. Uh, with with the clams and, and shellfish and uh, uh, salmon is a big thing now. Um, it's it's uh, I, I want to call it like like a, a a controlled growth is is really what it is. You know they are not they're not going out and 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 fishing these things as much as planting them and and growing them on their own. Uh, they're just ha they just they just happen to be growing them in the ocean. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. And one of the things with the Marinia project, this is this would be one of the, you know, again I mentioned earlier that uh, it's been a while a while ago, so I'll repeat it. Uh, one of the things I liked about the Marinia project is after that initial fifty million dollar investment in the flotel, the floating hotel. There were a lot of profitable ventures that could be undertaken uh, there in the open ocean. One of those things was, you know, fish farming, and I'm guessing a lot of these things that that uh, that were discussed in, in, you know, this is chapter five, aquaculture. Uh, I'm sure a lot of those things could be pursued as well. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of possibilities, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs are already pursuing these routes. But uh, you know, as far as funding for a libertarian project, you know, it's always a problem, as we've been saying over and over again. Uh, you know that could be uh, could be one interesting route uh, for uh, I guess for 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 new country builders or uh, I guess free port builders or whatever you want to call them. All right, so that was chapter five. Not a whole lot to to mention there, uh, but chapter six, marine mining, and we're almost done, guys. It's no two-hour episode, which I, which is all right, which is all right. But uh, quote, undersea mining in some areas is already big business. Magnesium is ex extracted directly from seawater. Oil and sulfur have been taken from beneath the seafloor for many years. The ocean is already being opened, for, up, opened up for commerce, and before long, private industry will be spending more on undersea commerce than government now spends on undersea warfare. End quote. So let me just... Okay, and for the, for the sake of time, um, pretty much what Kerry Thornley does here is just go through, you know, all of the mining operations that are taking place on the ocean floor, um, you know, for, for whatever, you know, uh, gems or, or whatever, whatever is down there, gems, oil, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, I don't think we need to we need to read this 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 article, Jason. Um, just you know some some possible you know some some possible mining, uh, you know potentials uh, or potential for you know libertarian entrepreneurs. But again, like this is where well, this is kind of heavy industry stuff. I mean, uh, it costs a lot to open an oil rig. It costs a lot to deep sea drill for. Uh, you know, whatever element you're, 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 you're looking to get. So I don't know how valuable it would be to kind of read this entire proposal uh, from, from Carrie Thornley. Uh, what do you think? Uh, no, it's, it's big business company after big business company after big business company. Um, I don't really see, I mean, there's the, a little piece about Aqualandia that might be 
interesting. Yep. Yep. I know. I know exactly. I just, yeah, I just looked at that part. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be interesting. So yeah, we'll, we'll cover this part real quick. So, uh, quote, the first claim theory, for example, as some prominent libertarians espouse it, would put most future marine mineral exploitation under the control of an aspiring monarchy, which calls itself Aqualandia. For His Majesty King Mary I, in a proclamation dated 10th August 1961, published a claim to all the lands of the world that exist beneath the oceans and other saltwater bodies of the world, except for the portion, except that portion of ocean bottom or other saltwater bottom lands, which are now claimed as the property of the various government in the world, and where such claim is, as of this date, recognized as valid by international law. The proclamation goes on to assure that Aqualandia does not claim any right to govern, regulate, or interfere with the present or future use of the waters above its land, and adds that Aqualandia's, uh, Aqualandia is patterned after that of England. This proclamation was published in a pamphlet called The Aqualandian in July of 1966. But somehow I feel to see, speaking only for myself, how recognition of this first claim, if indeed it is, is the first, would possibly be in my interest. On the other hand, the standard argument of the most ardent admirers of Henry George, which hold that natural resources should not be claimed by individuals or companies or societies at all, but should be owned in common and, and at best a sort of universal profit sharing plan and which would tend to condemn the present companies involved in ocean mining for coercively monopolizing the mineral deposits, while certainly more rational than the unmodified first claim theory, brings up a host of new problems in its place and putting aside those which fall into the who would administrate category entirely, this approach would, unless liberalized, go counter to our primary purpose of winning over, the, over to the libertarian position, those basic industries now mining the seas. Quote, one factor which may bring about a resolution, at least with regard to the ocean, is the technical difficulties involved. By the time one has extracted minerals of almost any sort from the sea, a great deal of thought and energy has been applied. It is far more difficult than driving a claim post into, into the ground or panning gold. Arbitrary first claims on behalf of Southern California groups and their will and their like will tend to be ignored and will be next to impossible to enforce. And the Georgists, if they can point out to the mining companies a self-interested motive for voluntarily paying out mining rental, uh, mineral rent fees for the, uh, to the population at large, will find little opposition from laissez-faire libertarians. In the meantime, it is important that the rest of us develop a rational and simple procedure for establishing ownership of the natural resources in the sea, perhaps along the lines of John Locke's mixing labor formula, and quote, Carrie Thornley. Now, uh, hold on one second. Let me, let me re reread one portion here, just... For, for my purposes and, and maybe for some of the listeners to quote, and the Georges, if they can point out to the mining companies a self-interested motive for voluntarily paying out mineral rent fees to the population at large, we will find uh, we'll find a little, uh, little opposition from laissez-faire libertarians. So, so what he's kind of discussing here is, you know, how I mentioned I mentioned earlier that you can't really lay claim to you know the water, right? You really can't because you know it's, it, it's it's constantly changing, right? So you, you can't really lay claim to the water, but you, I mean, you know, claims of property could be made uh, on the minerals on the ocean floor. So, so I guess, as, as, you know, as the Georgians would point out, you know, mineral rent fees, to the, rent fees to the population at large for, you know, since, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if I like that either. I mean, it would mean that the ocean floor belongs to everybody. And that's very communistic in, in my opinion. Yeah, it's very collectivist, yeah. Uh it's if it, this would be a fantastic philosophical discussion right as as we talked about you can't own the water because water is constantly moving so you can't say i own from x to x blah 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 the ocean floor which is technically not water it's technically solid ground it just happens to be underwater i uh, i can one homestead the ocean floor and if one can homestead the ocean floor, aren't that don't they own the minerals that are within the boundaries of their homestead the same as they would, you know, in in Oregon or Colorado or Texas? Yep. In my opinion, yes, yes. So 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 when when uh, individuals began to homestead the the ocean floor, uh, you know, they they build their houses on there, they start their aquaculture farms or whatever. Um, yeah, I would say you know. Um, as far as the ocean floor, yeah, I, 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 I would say so. I mean, that's what, uh, you know, from a proprietary anarchist perspective, that makes sense. But let me posit this question to you, Jason. So since that's not happening, right, uh, if people aren't homesteading the ocean floor, uh, 
I mean, I, I think this is certainly an interesting, you know, discussion and maybe something that's, uh, you know, maybe me, you and Kyle should get together to to talk about. So I guess it'd be more philosophical discussion as far as ownership of, of the ocean floor and the minerals thereof. But I guess since, since people are not homesteading the ocean yet, where does that leave the minerals? Um, I mean, it, it, it basically, uh, as of right now, it just uh, leaves it to, you know, whatever government's going to, you know, whatever... Uh, uh, you know, oil corporations going to lobby the government enough to get a, to get uh, permission to drill off the off the coast of uh, Florida or wherever it is, right? So I don't know yeah. what you think. Well, if uh, I I I got to go back to the land on this. I mean, if if nobody claims the the land, then the minerals or or whatever whatever goods can be gotten off the floor are are, are unclaimed, right? I mean, just as the berry bush on the unclaimed land is f for whoever comes across it right right yeah yeah all right if, if if nobody owns the land that the berry bush is on then whoever comes and picks the berries gets them first yeah. I, I i feel i feel it would be the same way with the ocean floor right right you know i i, I certainly agree i certainly agree so so i guess the the point here is that uh, you know any of those uh, oil contracts granted by 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 the state, uh, you know all of that is obviously j just as with uh, say federal lands, uh, so-called or uh, public lands. You know it's it's all unclaimed property. You know ready for ready to be homesteaded. Um, so yeah I, I I yeah I agree with you man I agree with you but uh, yeah anything else on that one? Uh, no I I, I think we I think we covered it with that that last little exchange there um but uh <sighs> like to to lay claim I mean, aqualandia aqualandia is is a fantastic theoretical and and again it, it's a fantastic theoretical discussion but again it it <sighs> as recognized by international law bam appeal to authority again if you're appealing to authority then you're recognizing the state. If you're recognizing government and, and things like that, then you're not you're not practicing Vanu if you if you're trying to use their laws for your advantage because you're exposing yourself to the coercion. You're not you're not trying to exercise freedom, you're trying to exercise the state. Right, right. And I feel like I should make a distinction here. Exercising, you know. Uh, utilizing legal exercises is different than uh, the appealing to authority that Jason's referring to here. Uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. But uh, it's interesting. I would recommend Erwin Strauss's book. I'll mention it again, How to Start Your Own Country, just for the case, the, the case history section. Uh, there have been a lot more, I guess, new country, model country, model nation projects that have, that have, you know, uh, come about. And uh, there have been at least a couple, uh, I guess, a couple organizations or whatever that have. They they laid arbitrary claim to every like the the entire universe you know everything outside of the the atmosphere of of uh, of Earth uh, and then there I, you know as with uh, Aqualand I don't know, remember if that was a specific case study in, in Erwin Strauss's book but there were those who claimed uh, you know jur jurisdiction over the entire ocean obviously arbitrary claims no one recognized them but uh, it's it's still kind of comical uh, and I'm guessing a lot of those were were satire and. Uh, obviously not serious, unless the individual is a psychopath, which is not outside the realm of possibility, right? No, it's not outside the possibility at all. God complex times 10 trillion. Yeah, <laughs> and then some. Yeah, well, I guess 10 trillion to the 10 trillionth, yeah. Um, <laughs> very good, very good. So... <laughs> So yeah, you know, interesting, I guess, article series uh, by Mr. Uh, Kerry Thornley, uh, again, you know, an associate of Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, <laughs> so I think the, the earlier articles are more practical. Uh, again, you know, pursuing things uh, on an individual basis and, you know, working with others when you can, I think, is, 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 is the best way to go. Uh, the, these grand collectivist schemes... Uh, you know, they, 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 they tend to fail, you know, they, they tend to fail for, for one reason or another, or they lead to concessions with the state, uh, which is not good, not good. So, uh, as far as kind of the, the earlier suggestions, you know, large boats and small boats, uh, yeah, I mean, for, for small boats, you're pursuing minimal sailboating with, uh, with a family member with, uh, with you by yourself or, uh, with a family. Great. You know, that's, that, that's, that's very feasible, very feasible with a large boat. If you want to do some, uh, I guess, uh, some profit-making ventures on, uh, aboard, 
Uh, I think that's practical too. You know, as long as you're not, um, as, as long as it's not, uh, you know, aircraft carrier type uh, or decommissioned aircraft carrier type free port. Uh, that's very practical. Uh, and again, I, 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 I do think it, I do think a temporary autonomous zone like a, a or I guess a, a mobile free port uh, would would be would be very plausible. But again, it just comes down to the initial capital investment necessary. And yeah, I, just don't, I don't think that one's very feasible. I think it's I think it's it, it could be it could be done. I think without uh, with, without much without much concern, but other than the capital investment. But uh, but yeah, I guess that that's that's kind of uh, all I've got. Uh, any closing thoughts, Jason? No, I, I just like the 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 voluntary floating society idea is it's absolutely fantastic and it, it's very very intriguing to me. Uh, it is philosophically and it is physically possible. The feasibility of it throws in a lot of questions, man. And you know, until <sighs> I almost want to say un until until like until somebody has the capital to do it right. I I don't believe it's it's gonna happen. Uh, sadly, I just don't believe it's gonna happen. And let um, me, I guess, let me let me jump in there and, and, and kind of say I uh, I'll just I I think you're thinking more large scale. Um, for for small scale, like uh, if it was uh say me you and you know seven other I guess uh, anarchists uh, yes, out there yeah, on yeah. a boat, you know that that permanent floating voluntary society I think is very very feasible. But yeah, large scale, uh, you know, it's like a private city sort of thing on the water. I certainly yeah, agree with you. That that's what I, that's what I was referencing. Um, the large scale, you know, it's going to attract so much attention, and when it attracts attention, it opens itself to coercion. Um, small scale, you know, a, a twenty, you know, a twenty six foot boat, you know, uh, eight or ten people, it's it's entirely possible. It's entirely possible. And then as we talked about with the barrels and and creating your own little floating island. Um, it's 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 entirely possible. I, I can't I can't emphasize the possibility enough, especially with the technology that we have today, right? With with the, with the, the, the solar panels and being able to do, to uh, desalinate the seawater and and the advancements in in um, uh, small scale farming that we that we know right now and and it, and and it, wouldn't, to... it wouldn't take hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars either. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm I'm saying you could probably for a tenth of that, you know, for for twenty twenty thousand dollars. I'm I'm just off the top of my head twenty thousand dollars to get the materials to get the boat, put some elbow grease into the boat to make it how to make it what you need it. It's possible. It's not a lot of money, and that is cheaper than a modern vehicle than a new modern vehicle. And certainly a modern lifestyle, uh, say a surveillance society lifestyle. Uh, certainly, certainly. So, uh, anything else, man? No, that was, I'm, I'm tapped out on that one. All right, cool. So, uh, I guess just to reiterate, if you want to purchase this when it's available for free, uh, just go to tinyurl.com forward slash boat freedom, uh, or you can just go to vomitpodcast.com forward slash OFN and get the entire Ocean Freedom Notes publication, uh, you know, with the permanent voluntary society issues, uh, uh, or the articles in there. Uh, so yeah, the website is vonniepodcast.com. Again, for the uh, Vonnie Podcast listeners, first time I've mentioned this, uh, like a second time now, but first episode I mentioned this, uh, Liberty Under Attack, uh, Direct Action Over Political Crusading Shirts. Obviously very related to, uh, to Vonnie, and certainly a shirt that if anyone would be proud to rep. So libertyunderattack.com forward slash shirts. Small, larges, and extra larges available. $15 and, uh, you know, free shipping and... I'll send you some free goodies along with that. Uh, cryptocurrencies, PayPal, uh, all of that good stuff. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's uh, that's all we've got for you. And uh, hopefully next week, uh, I'm not uh, might be uh, might be Jason and I again next week as far as the release. But uh, you know, hopefully uh, in the following episodes we can get back to the. We're only like three or four episodes away from finishing season two. I'm so excited for season three, guys. <laughs> we put together the first handful of episodes, and uh, so so this season will have maybe. By the time it's all said and done, maybe 20 episodes thereabouts. Uh, season three is going to be the one that continues like into in, in perpetuity, essentially. Uh, <laughs> like for for each of these episodes, when we're, when we're developing and, and modernizing Vanu, you know, with with the I guess with with the state how it is now and technology available. Uh, Kyle and I were talking Vanu and Cities will probably be like a 10-part series. 
Like, it, it, it's going to be pretty ridiculous in a, in a good way, in a good way. So you, you certainly have that to look forward to. Hopefully we can get back to, you know, I want to conclude season two already. Uh, so I'm sure you guys are, are ready to, uh, you know, make, ready for us to make this, make this practical again. So uh, that said, BonniePodcast.com, and we'll talk to you next week.